Hey guys, Loman02. I'm going to be doing a follow-up um, uh, deck tech slash deck alteration to this four-color blood list. So, before I start, this is Canadian Highlander, so if you're not interested in Highlander, I'm sorry. This is what this is about. Uh, and if you are not interested in listening to deck techs or deck musings or building considerations, please immediately go down to the comments section. There's going to be a litany of gameplay, and it's all going to be timestamped down there. So if you don't want to watch me muse about the deck and about building in it, then please go down to that section and find um, and find the timestamps for the actual gameplay in a wide variety of matchups. So, before we start, I've been trying to tune this deck in. I did one piece on it initially, um, and the deck has undergone some change. So, it used to be a 34 land deck. I did find that I was flooding a little bit too often, and I kind of figured I would, because this deck was initially designed by me to uh, to be played in what amounts to Euro Lander uh, without Moxon. Um, it also generally tended not to play against as much combo decks, or as many combo decks, that were at least reliable and quick. Um, so it ran more man lands, which I ended up cutting out uh, for the Moxon, but then I kind of tended to find that I wanted to have a little bit more of an edge against the combination style decks. So the decks that I assume are going to be naturally predatory and very effective against this archetype or this strategy of four-color blood are going to be speed combo decks which I don't think we're horrible against because we have edged a little bit lower on the curve, put a little more disruption in, and also put in just some more just good aggressive creatures, like the deck's running Putrid Leech. Um, and you know what, let me bring up the display window. Although I have gone over this deck kind of a little bit more ad nauseum, um, I will pull up the, the display panel. So if you haven't watched my previous video, you can at least see some of the cards I'm talking about. I'm not going to be doing a complete deck tech here. I did that before. What I'm going to be doing is just some of the changes that we've made, other than putting the box toppers in, which, I mean... Goodness gracious, guys, look at this art. Like, I don't like the, the frame on the top here, this, like, weird spiky frame. But the frameless art, I just, I, I can't get enough of it. Anyways, off topic. Anyways, so I've cut the deck down from 34 lands to 32. Cutting some of the man lands, as well as some of the non-essential lands, or lands that I thought were non-essential. Like, I've actually cut, um... One Blood Crypt, so I'm only running Badlands now. The lightest splash in this deck is red, followed up shortly thereafter by black. Black, white, and green tend to be the base. It's an Abzon or a Junk build. Um... This version of the deck is a lot less value-oriented and a lot more oriented on just getting folks dead quick and then disruption. Um, so it's looking to edge a little bit lower on the curve so that it has a stronger game plan against the aggressive combo decks, also against the aggro decks. I think this deck actually gets a little bit better against the aggressive decks. Well, it attacks the aggressive decks in a different way than more... Um, more value-oriented or value mid-range decks do. So value mid-range decks are going to tend to try to make the switch to be a control deck against the uh, the aggro decks, the just aggressive decks. This deck's just going to look to outrace them, um, is what it's doing. I sometimes explain like the style or the theory of gameplay for this deck as being mini hoof, like mini crater hoof, because really what you're doing is you're, you're chaining you know some of these, these Moxen, or some of these, these Mana Dorks, into one of these, which all of these fours are just bombs. Um, Bloodbraid Elf is probably the weakest, Huntmaster probably the weakest, um, a Johnny again another weak one, but like the rest of these are just bombs, like Butcher the Horde, Queen Marchessa, Siege Rhino, Saskia, um, Elsbeth Gideon, uh, Palace Jailer, and then the threes and the twos kind of also support that game plan. So, you know, oftentimes if you're like turn one dork, which you have a high number of, and you also have the mocks in here, this is a, a three mocks, uh, mind twist, uh, point spread. Um, list, but, you know, if one of your doors gets burned off, you know, generally speaking, you're not going to, like, turbo out by turn two or three, you know, one of the four drops. You're just going to have to, you know, if it gets burned off, then you just play a two drop. So it actually tends to work out pretty well. Like, oftentimes, you're going to find that, like, people just bolt the birds, because it's, it's common adage, and it's generally not a bad plan to bolt the birds. But against this deck, it tends to be fine. Like, you're actually not that upset about it. What you often do is just, you know, be like, alright, cool, you bolted my birds. I'll play out of Goyf, which is going to now be incidentally bigger, because I have a creature, probably a land from a fetch land, because this deck plays all of them. Um, you know, and there's a, an instant or a sorcery in the graveyard. You have scavenging use, just gets randomly bigger if they bolt your birds, you know, initially. So basically just a, a ton of high-impact twos that just do tons of damage. Like, that's why Putrid Leech is in here, because I want a card that could, one, get out of bolt range, um, and two, just close people's eyelids quickly. Like, this deck tends to try to race against aggressive decks or combo decks, um, you know, and a lot of its cards I want to trade at two for one exchange rate, so that's why you still see cards like Kitchen Finks in here, because against control, like if they Wrath, it's still a two one. You gain some incidental life, which is not that relevant, but it's just it's a two for one against Wrath decks. Or point removal was a two for one. And against aggro, it, it tends to be a three to four for one because you know you you play it, you gain two life, it negates a shock. You block a small dude kill the small dude, probably trade. The Kitchen Finks comes back as a 2-1. You gain two more life, which gets another shock out of their deck, and you have an attacker on the following turn. It's just, you know, that's kind of the concept, is that you're just going to end up racing the, the aggressive decks, as opposed to kind of transforming into a control deck, like more value-oriented mid-range decks would do against um, aggressive decks. 
So what are the liabilities in, in, in kind of going in with that game plan for a more mid-range deck? This is more of a mid-range aggressive deck, um, is what I would call it. Um, I wouldn't quite call it mid-range, but I wouldn't quite call it an aggro deck either. Really what it is, is like almost the ideal switch deck. Um, it's intended to just outrace aggro, and it's intended to just grind out control. Um, but its strongest liabilities are right in its midsection against other uh, mid-range decks. Um, you know, it, disregarding aggress or aggressive combo or just combo decks. Um, value mid-range decks tend to have a much greater liability against blue-based meta uh, meta games uh, because they tend to rely on more cards to go right. They do have some value-oriented cards, but typically speaking, they embrace less efficiency and independent card quality of the um, of the value-oriented decks tend to be a little bit lower, or they're at least predicated upon more cards. They have more intra-deck synergy. What I mean by that is you have cards like Birthing Pod, you have cards like, um, you know, Natural Order, um, you know, cards cards like that that really just depend on other cards to make them work, um, or they work better in conjunction with other cards. Whereas, like, what I'm trying to do with this deck is just make every card just a haymaker. Um, so they're just all relevant. Like, and against blue decks, it's tough, because, like, if all of your stuff needs to be countered, they're going to run out of counter spells. And what I tend to see with this deck is it's either the first thing the first thing lands and kills them, like, that may be a Scrap Heap Scrounger, or just, like, a Kasali Pride Major, a Gaddick Teague, or the last thing you play kills them. You know, they can counter, you know, everything after the first thing that resolves, or they can counter everything before the last thing resolves, but each independent card is in general capable of just killing them. And that's kind of the point. Like, you know, against blue decks, it's very tough to beat that strategy, because your card quality is just really high. You're running a lower land count. Just, well, we're running a lower land count, but still some higher uh, some higher acceleration count, which is where the deck does assume a little bit of liability against blue decks. But, you know, even these dorks are not horrible. I mean, like, dorks can still beat down, and they're not irrelevant. We do have two man lands in the deck. Um... You know, and, and at the end of the day, it runs just the most efficient um, disruption suite. So it's just got, you know, the, your duress, your inquisition, your thought seize, uh, your collective brutality, um, you know, like a braid, swords of plowshares, path to exile, fatal push, you know, but not a ton of it. So it's very lightly splashed interaction, um, you know, most of which, if, if it's possible to make flexible, you know, it's like lightning bolt is removal. It's also just, it can dome people, like, which is not irrelevant. It does happen quite a bit. Uh, lightning bolt, same thing. You know, a braid does not dome. And I actually, this is one of the cards that I replaced from the last deck tech. I was running Arc Trail in here. Arc Trail is more of a fair card. Well, how do I put it? Arc Trail is a better card in, like, fair, very fair metagames. Um, so if you plan on playing against, like, you know, white you know, white weenie death and taxes, or red deck wins, or other mid-range decks, or like hoof, like crater hoof decks. I tend to like uh, Arc Trail better than a braid, but I think a braid is just more flexible. Now, you can't really accrue value uh, like you can with Arc Trail, but a braid just does more. Um, the one thing it does not do is go to face, so that is kind of a liability with the card, but I was like, you know, I was between this and Goblin Crater Maker. Uh, Goblin Crater Maker, if you're not familiar with the card, it's still a card I, I'm going to try in this deck, but my heart tells me that it's just a mana too much to do. So Goblin Crater Maker, you know, it's it's kind of like, uh, I'm trying to think of the card's name, Ember Hauler, but it does a little more. So two mana, two two. Yeah, fine. Um, you know, you get a body with it, which does give it a little bit of equity over cards like Arc Trail and uh, Braid, because you just get a body, and it can also just attack, which is not bad. Having another creature is definitely not bad, but it also has a spell written on it, which says Sacrifice Crater Maker, choose one. Uh, it can either deal two damage to a creature, which makes it, you know, a miniature Braid, um, or, you know, one half of Arc Trail. Or it can destroy a colorless non-land permanent, which means that it can deal with nonsense, you know, like like var variety of artifacts, you know, whether it be Isochron Scepter, whether it be a Mox, you know, Eldrazi, like Emrakul, Big Eldrazi, um, can deal with a lot of cards, you know, it can deal with a Sophie, you know, a, a sort of Feast and Famine, Jit, just does a lot, right? Like, so this card can just do a ton, um... The problem with it is, is it's it's you know it's a two mana two two, which means that it's kind of a liability if you're not using it immediately because it's just going to sit around and maybe not accrue that much uh, value. Whereas something like you know um, Kasali Pride Mage essentially has haste because it gives something else a boost the turn it comes in due to Exalted, um, you know, and it also just hits a little more. Um, it, you know, it can get you know it can destroy artifacts or enchantments. It doesn't really care about the the colored component like uh, Crater Maker does, and it's just generally a higher impact card. I think um, in general, it just has more range. Um, the reason I like this card, though, is because it's a body, but I think a Braid is just a little bit better. It's a little more powerful than Crater Maker is, but Crater Maker is a card that I'm probably going to test out in the list uh, to... because it's just a ton of value, right? Like, it just gives you a lot of flexibility, and I think in these lists, you want to have as much flexibility as you can in your list because you're a Switch deck, and you want your cards to be able to do as much as you're able to get each independent card to do. 
Um, that's kind of the theory of play for how it beats control too. Is each of its cards are just so independently, you know, like um, relevant on their own because they they can do so much against you know most decks um, that everything's a must counter. And if everything's a must counter, eventually they run out, and eventually either the first thing you played or the last thing that does that, that resolves when they run out of answers just beats them. That's kind of the theory. So Greater Maker may get in there at some point. And a braid is a new ad over Arc Trail. Um. Uh, that said, I think we have another couple couple new ads in the deck. Um, I am running Gaddock. I think I was running Gaddock before. What else do we have in here that's new? I'm trying to think what else I have that's new. Like Mind Twist, I don't think I had in my last build. That's that's another ad. I got it in there as my last point. And you know, I have kind of a love hate relationship with Mind Twist. I won't be. I won't lie. Um, I think this is a very high variance card. Um, I think more often than not in this deck, it's going to be. In general, used as like a him to Turek, uh, almost. I just think him to Turek, and that's the card that I have. I think currently in my sideboard, possibly, which my sideboard is not my literal sideboard, guys. I don't use it against you if you play me online. I it's my building board. I just use it as building space to kind of hold cards that are on the verge for me. I don't. Uh, Double black's kind of tough uh, in the early game, which is when you really want to resolve a him. Um, despite the card being very powerful, I mean, if it was like honestly, I've considered playing um, Risefall. And if you're not familiar with that card, let me pull it up real fast. Rise. Um, Rise Fall. So Rise Fall is... Uh, Rise is not the relevant half. The f- half that's relevant to this card, this uh, split card, is false. This target player reveals two cards at random from their uh, hand and discards each non-land card revealed this way. Fall is kind of like a Hymn to Turek that actually, if it was literal Hymn to Turek, I would probably play the card even though one of the split sides of the card would not be playable in the deck. Uh, just because I think Black-Red is actually easier to cast on curve than Double Black is in this deck. Double requirements are really tough for this list. And especially because both colors, like Black and Red, are are in the lightest uh, volume um, of cards that I have in the deck. I, I just think it's really, really tough. Um, anyways, you know that was um, you know that that was uh, uh, something I recently considered, and I did did add the mind twist. Even though I think oftentimes you're probably going to be doing it as a value mind twist, you're not going to generally be mind twisting their whole hand. Um, you know, uh, so the way I've, I've had this card come up, I don't think I've ever resolved this in the deck uh, for starters uh, since the changes I've made. And I've played a lot of games with it, but it just hasn't come up. Um, <clears throat> but the way I think it's going to generally play out is if I have kind of a slower draw, I'm going to try to do it on turn two or three and just get half their hand, just blow half their hand apart. Um, you know, or I'm going to do it as a curve topper. Like, I'm going to play out my threats, you know, force force exchange of cards, and then before my last threat, I'm going to put this on the stack. If they counter it, fine, which I think is what happened. I think when I actually played this card once, they countered it when I did this, and I just played another relevant threat, and they didn't have another counter, and, and it won the game. Um, that's kind of how I intend to use it with this deck. It's, you know, it's a higher variance card, because if you're playing against an aggressive deck, the card's just bad. Like, you just don't want to have Mind Twist in your hand. Um, you know, but the fact that we're running a bunch of Mana Dorks, and the rest of our points are Mock Spread, uh, means that, you know, you can power this thing out. It's very powerful if you can power it out early and just hit half their hand. Uh, whether you're playing playing against any deck, that's very powerful. Unless you're playing against, like, Reanimator, and you just get unlucky. But, um, but yeah, I think my twist was the right call. I don't think this is, you know, well, one, I'd have to make some changes and get rid of, like, a uh, uh, Mox. I don't think this is a Stoneforge Jit deck. Um, I kind of discussed that before. I, I'm not a big fan of that card in this list, because this is more of a tempo-oriented list. I think if we were to go to more of a value route, there's definitely a stronger consideration to it. But I think I would probably play more Planeswalkers first. Um, Jit's very powerful, but Jit's very slow. Like, four mana is a ton to invest into, you know, Jit in this deck. Um, and the concept behind this deck is is that your four is already do enough. Like, if, if I can spend four mana to tie up a Jit, or spend four mana to play a Saskia and just... Come on, reader. Play four, pay four mana to play a Saskia, or, you know, a Siege Rhinoceros, or a Queen Marchessa, or a Butcher of the Horde, or any of these other nonsenses, and just win the game. Like, I'd rather spend four mana to just win the game. Um... You know, shit is more attritional. Not saying the card's bad, but I just don't think it's this is the right home for it. I don't think this list wants it. Um, trying to think of other changes I've made to the list. I don't think there are any more. Uh, so yeah, the, the deck is really designed at the end of the day to be like as much as possible the quintessential switch deck. Um, you know, it is a mid-range list, I think, in its heart, but it doesn't really have as many value lines. Or, at a minimum, it, it cruises value virtually. So, when I, when I say that, what I mean is it just tries to end the game faster so that less cards are relevant that your opponent could have. Um, but this deck's very good at controlling the pace of the game. Um, you know, whether you're playing against aggro and you're tell, you're getting them to pump the brakes by using an Ajani down tick to, you know, change racing math or, you know, a lightning helix to change... Come on, buddy. 
Ch- Lightning Helix, I guess it's a textless card. Three damage, gain three life. Um, any target. Uh, you know, you're changing, using these cards to kind of change racing math or playing on a door into like just completely stymie, you know, an X1 turbo, you know, deck, like a, you know, a turbo out like three or four X1 deck, uh, which Doran does, kind of actually a hate card. Um, you know, or you're just using these cards to just smash the, the eyelid shut of a control player. Because, I mean, if you get the play with this deck, um, or even the draw with a mock start, and they can't counter your first thing, like, you know, it's pretty, it's not impossible to get a, a good two drop down that can just end the game, you know, uh, on turn two, you know. And that's kind of the, the, the intent behind a lot of these cards. And a lot of them exchange two for one rate. So the deck does still have to have that mid range, the inherent value of mid range decks where, like, a lot of your cards, you know, interaction against a lot of your cards are going to uh, cost your opponent two for one exchanges. Um, which I think you still want to be, but I think you also need to be lower to the ground. So, you know, I do think that um, if you look at, like, the, the style of build in, in like, the uh, the finals of the 2018 Canadian Highlander Championships, um, I, I, you know, I think most folks are familiar with a guy named uh, Kevin Basta, um, and he has a list that's exceedingly slammed low. It's got stuff like, you know, Curd Apes, um, you know, I, I don't want to say he's, like, running, like, cr- crazy stuff like Wild Dogs, but he has, like, the Wild Dog-style cards, like, cards that are better than Wild Dogs but are kind of like that. So his one-drop slot is really chock-full, and he's probably got rid of more of the fours and probably doesn't have as many mana dorks in the deck, but probably still some. Um, I would say that, like, his list is a concession to what he probably expected was a very combo-heavy meta um, meta game going into into that tournament. Um you know, at the price of, of also assuming more risk against value-oriented mid-range decks, and probably a few more, a little bit more liability against more hard control-style decks, because decks like that that are going to run the Curd Apes and, like, the uh, the Wild McCoddles of the world are going to have to play, are going to ha- be more resource-intensive to win the game, i.e. they're going to have to play more threats than this list will, um, to actually end games, which means that if you get multi-for-one by control on, like, a Wrath of God effect or, you know, any, you know, Toxic Deluge, you name it, um, and generally speaking, it's going to be a lot more detrimental to the to to you know um, your game plan if that's kind of how you built your deck. Whereas I tend to think that you know this deck gets around kind of that weakness against like the the sweepers and like the some of the uh, you know the white or black uh, or even red um, you know sweeper effects that are generally complemented with blue. Um, I think it gets around that by just having a bunch of bomb fours that basically you get one down, and if they sweep, you know, maybe they get a couple of mana dorks, but by that point, you're going to have your, your fourth land drop to play your next four. And if they sweep, you just play your next four, and they have to answer it again. And if they answer it again, then you draw into your next four. That's why you see there's an awfully high densi- there's an awful high density of fours. Um, you know, I do think that that gives me, that it makes this list that I've got built here, I think it assumes more risk against combination-style decks, because it will tend to be a turn slower at goldfishing. They're like the 4C four, four Basta style list that have, you know, this one drop slot probably up to like 24 Five or 26 and probably cuts down these fours and threes significantly. Um, so I think there's liabilities to both ways of building. Um, that said, you know, I, I do think that this is a very strong list. It's been very successful um, recently on, in the online meta. Uh, keep in mind this is also built for being played online. So I don't get to use Sorens and Moles. So 32 lands is very low. Um, I think it could possibly cut one more, but I've definitely cut two and it's, the deck's running a lot better, I think, with 32. Uh, but, you know, when you're on four color, I do think that you, in general, need to have um, a larger mana suite, a, a greater capacity of lands, uh, just to enable that fixing, uh, so you can cast your relevant spells. Uh, generally speaking, if the deck does get to cast spells, it tends to win games. Um, you know, and I do think in general it's fairly match neutral. I mean, like I said, I think value mid range is tough for it. I think combo is a little tougher, but I think we've edged low enough that that we still have decent game against uh, those style of decks um, because of our increased clock and then the disruption suite that we've chosen to play. Anyways, guys, those are the changes to the deck. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention one card. I was talking about it last time. Palace Jailer's in now, too. I took a land out and actually put another four in. And it's Palace Jailer. That's how many lands there were. It was just too many lands. Um, Palace Jailer is, you know, he's just another bomb. Like, you know, yes, he's a 2-2 body, but, you know, he's a 2-2 body that's a card engine as well and removal spell. So, um... Typically speaking, this deck's very good at keeping the the game in, uh, the game's pace at your control, especially once you're able to start chaining threes and fours together. If you can chain threes and fours together uh, once or twice, generally speaking, the game just ends because they're all just so good. Anyways, guys, quick pause. I'm gonna have a ton of games for you this time around against a, uh, across a lot of different matchups. So I'll be back momentarily uh, with uh, the first game uh, that we've got up for this evening. Alrighty, guys, back. 
Uh, first hand was unkeepable, just didn't have enough action early. This hand's okay-ish. It lacks a threat, but it does have good mana disruption. It has good mana acceleration, and it has the ability to stone rain if necessary or get a relevant threat. I'm pretty happy when my opponent actually bolts the birds here, as it were. Um, I just go ahead and stone rain them with Vindicate right now to buy some tempo, because I'm looking to draw into a four. That may seem like a little bit of a weaker line, uh, but I think it's fine at this point, because they haven't really shown themselves to, to you know, be a quick deck. Now, when they play Overgrown Tomb, I assume I'm possibly in the mirror. I do play my Winter Orb out here because I assume they're going to tap down for a 2-drop here. If they don't, then I'm going to be able to just play my birds out on the following turn. I don't really have a great need for my mana right now. Um, there's also not, not, not an impossibility that I actually use the uh, the Horizon Canopy here. Now, they play out a Nissa Voice of Zendikar. I go ahead and make mana with my Deathrite Shaman, uh, cycle off my... Um, my uh, Horizon Canopy, draw into a Felka Wrath Aristocrat, which I'm very happy to draw into. And now, you know, having a Mox plus these two dorks is going to mean that, you know, my mana is going to be a lot le or a lot more free. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Felka Wrath Aristocrat, this card is is great, and it basically just got me out of a really bad situation with Nissa Voice of Zendikar here. I'm able to smash her down to zero, get her off the board, and leave my opponent with a plant token here. Uh, they go for a Tainted Pact here, and then I, I think just concede. I don't know if they didn't realize Winter Orb. Um, Winter Orb makes it so they're not going to get the untap with whatever card they get. I mean, they're going to be able to untap the, the Gaia's Cradle. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, or maybe they played the wrong card. I can't remember. But anyways, you know, Winter Orb plus a bunch of Mana Dorks and one threat is just kind of enough, I think. Um, enough disruption, plus, you know, enough pressure in the air. Um, was a little dicey there, but one of the things you'll find that uh, often when I play this deck, and, you know, so, some of it's because you don't get the value mulligans like you do under standard Canadian Highlander mulligan rules. Um, sometimes you have to rely on the power of your fours and, and the density of them just to draw into them. And you'll keep hands, especially once you've mulliganed at least once, that are probably a little less optimal, uh, but this deck does play the variants pretty well. Like, you know, you have a lot of powerful cards as long as you're able to cast them. So, in this deck, honestly, like, I would rather have a hand that buys me, like, three to four draw steps without a ton of pressure, but good mana progression. Because, like I was saying, in the deck tech portion, you know, if your mana can progress and you can cast your spells, like, your spells are all really good. And here, you know, it just took one card that actually wins the game to actually, you know, enable me to kind of pull ahead here. Um, and frankly, this may have been, you know, a game where we were attacking with mana dorks and then just doming them with death right shamans as well. Either way, you know, we managed to take game one and we go into game two. Quick pause, guys, and we'll be back for the next game in this match set. All right, guys, back. This hand looks great. I mean, it's got a good... So it doesn't have a one drop, but I mean, it's not the best of hands. Their hand looks very busted. They play on a Domri Raid, which is pretty problematic. I can't do anything on one because so I don't have a mana dork. They draw, and I believe they found one Kitchen Finks at this point, which they end up casting out. Uh, if I had an Assassin's Trophy, I just blow up their Domri. It could have been incorrect to do it. They tithe here. Um, they just get one land off of this. I believe they find Scrubland. So I think at this point, if they have like a Walker, I'm probably dead. They have Marchese, so I'm probably still just dead. So we're kind of in a mirror match. Uh, their deck looks a little more value-oriented than mine. Uh, I don't run a ton of Walkers in my list, and Domri Raid is not a Walker I'm very high on. I think Domri Raid's too high variance. Um, he doesn't really do enough. I get mine twisted here, and the game pretty much ends. Um, I just go ahead and pack it in. Like, their draw was pretty stellar. Um, you know, they, they powered down a Walker, found a creature, dropped a creature, got a card engine, also a threat engine online, uh, immediately following and then followed up with a mind twist to eat all my cards and leave me with just only one relevant threat. Um, yeah, that was enough for me. I'm just like, oh, okay, you know, good beats. And, and that's one of the things, like, these decks can have really powerful starts, and it looks like we're on very similar decks. I would say they're on a four-color blood variant, uh, likely a little bit more value-oriented if they're playing a card like Domri Raid. I'm I'm not a true believer in Domri Raid, but some folks may have had really good success with them. I think it really depends on your creature-based density. Um, in some ways, he kind of is a removal spell, but because he doesn't really protect himself, and, you know, he's not an assured card engine, I'm not really the biggest fan um, of him. But that said, the card is very powerful. If it, all, if it ever ultimates, you just win the game. But I think that's generally true of almost all Planeswalkers. Um, the fight ability, I don't know. I'm not really sold on it. I don't know, I don't know guys. Um, I could be wrong on that. Maybe he's worth a shot. But I, I feel like, you know, there are a couple Walkers I really like in Four Color Blood. Um, especially in oh, the three slot. And it's, it doesn't involve Nissa or Domri Raid. The, the two threes that I really like in, in Planeswalkers are both double black cards. So it's Liliana the Veil and Liliana the Last Hope. I'm not running the Last Hope, because I think Liliana the Last Hope is more of a value-oriented mid-range card. 
Um, you know, she's she's good against control, or she's good against, I'm sorry, she's good against aggro and control, so she does have that going for her, which is one reason to possibly include her, because she is very good against X1s, um, and or just shrinking cards to, to make the, the clock a little slower. Um, she's very good against control, because she's a ticking time bomb that just wins the game, um, and or she just gets threats back that they have to recounter, which is card advantage, right? Um, but the problem I have with her is she's just not um, she's not high impact enough against combo, um, so I ended up playing her. I don't think she does anything against combo. She's actually probably actively bad versus combo. Um, so I don't run her because of that reason. And I really want to be able to beat like the really good combo decks in the format, like Storm and stuff like that, um, and just have threats that just like win faster. So I'm not playing her right now, but I have played her historically. She's a great card, and if you're looking to actually have a better game against uh, the fair decks of the format, then I think she's a, definitely a worthy inclusion. That said, I'm not a huge fan of... Uh, of the Nissa we saw in the first game or Domri Raid. I don't think either are bad, but I don't think either are like particularly great either. Um, so that's my, my hot take, but we definitely just get trounced here. We get mind twisted, you know, basically everything that possibly can go wrong goes wrong. We get multiple card engines uh, into, you know, card denial <laughs> um, with uh, board dominance. So <laughs> basically in every aspect of the game, whether it be, you know, card advantage on either side uh, and or and or board development, we're just, we're, we're behind. So I go ahead and pack it inside to go to game three. Like we could possibly eat this one out if we got really lucky, but I'm, I'm just like, eh, I'm fine. All right, guys, quick pause, and we'll be back for game number three in this match. Hey, guys, we're back. All right, so this opener is fine. It's got a threat, it's got removal, it's got acceleration, and it's got, you know, a land that can turn into card draw. I do play my box out here because I figure artifact destruction on one is a lot less likely than hand denial on one. They play out a Deathrite Shaman. Um, I have to just bolt it here, and I attack. I don't know if I like how I fetch. I guess I fetch for red because I knew in the future I may want to actually um, draw and play red cards. I just go ahead and vindicate the Scavenging Ooze. I don't really want to have that thing in my life. They play on a Mana Confluence, a card that I actually recently cut from my mana base. I get Mind Twisted and I'm basically just off the top again, which is rough. I'm just like, well, but you know, Mind Twisted is a lot more agreeable when you are at least ahead on board or at least not vastly behind. They play a Goblin Guy, which again is like kind of like one of the more Basta style cards. Um... And I don't feel bad seeing a guide, because guide's going to give me more cards. It's not really that big, and I feel like I can race it. And I also have this Dromokus command to trade with it if I ever want to. I put a Putrid Leech in front of this thing, pump the Putrid Leech, expecting them to burn it in response. They do go ahead and oblige with a Coligan's command, but I prevent the damage off of Coligan's command, and also put a plus one plus one counter on my, five, or my at the time, 5-5 five, five Putrid Leech. Draw to a Johnny for the next turn, which is exactly what the deck wants to do, you know, against like these more aggressive starts from my opponent, is just draw into its good fours. Ties up one of their lands. They evidently don't have a relevant four of their own to play. We've got six power on the board, plus three power, you know, three damage that can come off of Johnny on the following turn. And if they can't stop all of that, then they're just dead. Um, that's kind of how the deck plays out. You know, that's kind of why I, I... Another reason why, like, I think the Basta list are very good against combo style list. I, I don't know... My opponent's build is a little more um, diverse, I guess, in its, uh, its strategic... Um, strategic application. So, like, when I see cards like Goblin God, I assume that you would slam the whole deck really low to the ground and play, like, the Basta style list. Uh, but then I see cards like um, Nissa and Domri, and those feel more value-oriented to me. Um... And I'm not saying you can't have a hybrid of either build, but I don't know. I tend to be like more of a, a builder that like wants to focus the deck on doing a very specific thing or like beating specific things, uh, whilst also assuming some risk. You know, I think my build assumes the most risk against still combo, and um, well, actually, I think the biggest risk for this deck is probably value based mid range, um, and then combo. But it really depends on the type of combo. Combo can vacillate depending on what type it is. Um, but it really does that just to beat up on either end of the spectrum. Um, you know, so Goblin Guy can actually shock me. I was like, oh, cool. You know, and actually I was happy to see a Goblin Guy because I think little aggressive creatures like that are fine for my deck to deal with because my creatures are all just bigger, kind of better. Than it. And it also provides me with value. And it's not really enough of a clock that, you know, I don't mind getting hit by it or like three or four times. I don't think it's even that bad, uh, per se. So anyways, you know, we managed to take this last one down here. You know, we've got an onboard draw. They got two cards in hand, but our board position is just vastly uh, superior, uh, despite being mind-twisted for, you know, eh, well, one relevant card, uh, Night of Autumn. Anyways, guys, quick pause. We'll be back for the next game. So this is a mirror match here of sorts. Um, you know, we were able to get there uh, with our build against uh, Updraft Elemental's, uh, you know, current build of Four Color Blood. Back momentarily, guys, for the next game. Alrighty, guys, we're back. Uh, this hand's great. So, you know, this hand has a turn one Liliana if we want it. They play on a Monastery Swiss Spear turn one. And, yep, double Moxon starts. 
feel like cheating, and they kind of are. That's why Moxon have not been reprinted. <laughs> um, but then Liliana, it just forced them to sack their Monastery Swift here. One of the cool things against these, like, rug tempo decks is that oftentimes their creature density is a little bit lower to accommodate with all the spells. Um, and I think it puts them in a tough spot because if you kill all of their creatures and they just have pump spells and burn and, like, cantrips, it can often put them in a really bad spot. They go ahead and maximize the velocity on this Kiln Fiend. Uh, this is going to be a pretty easy block with all my dudes. I don't really care about trading. They do have a mutagenic growth, but they're down to zero cards now, and they have a one-two. I draw to Arc Trail, which may have may or may not have been the best draw in my deck, but I had a lingering soul still to actually help kind of bide me some time. Uh, you know, I'll go ahead and uptick the Liliana. Let me just get rid of this card reader, guys. Uh, Liliana's at three right now. I just bolt their face. <laughs> I could have saved that, but I kind of want to continue to uptick the Liliana to just get value off of it. So when they do play their next thing, I can just force them to sack it. Um, and they're just stuck. I mean, they're just stuck at zero cards. They have cards like Gaia's Might, but we're going to draw into stuff like our four drops and just smash them, smash them shut, right? Smash the eyelids shut, as I like to call it. And they go ahead and pack it in here. Um, you know, I do think, like, Rug Tempo actually has a tougher time against decks like this uh, because this deck is just so threat-rich, whereas they're threat-light. You know, they do have the counter magic and the card draw and the pump and the tricks to kind of help support their more singular threats, but if they can't lock it up or if you kind of get their early threats then it puts them in this position where they kind of want to draw a split card that says counter spell plus threat or threat plus pump spell because none of their threats independently are that great and they kind of work their threats tend to work well as is um threats with the synergy of the rest of their cards but independently they're not that powerful right and i guess what i mean by that is this so like when i say that like think of young pyromancer if you're hellbent and you draw young pyromancer that's probably the one of the worst draws in your deck because the card is just a piker uh without first strike you know so it's not that good, whereas, like, if, you know, I'm drawing out of my deck, like, you know, my worst draws are going to tend to be Mana Dorks at this point, uh, which I have some number of, but not even those are, like, horrible, because, I mean, I've kind of got some, like, hedge bets in there, like, Noble Hierarch and, uh, and, um, and, and Deathrite Shaman, which are still fine in this position. Um, so anyways, you know, that's how this first game goes against Rug Tempo. Uh, quick pause, guys, we'll be back momentarily for game number two in this match. Alrighty, guys, back. Uh, yeah, Hands on the Keepable. This hand's a keeper, but it's not great. I bought him a Mystic Confluence, draw into a Horizon Canopy, cast on a DRS here. I believe, nope, DRS is not eat a removal spell. So I go ahead and attempt to resolve a spell here. It does not get countered. I get to look at their hand. Their hand is stacked. Their hand is Treasure Cruise. Well, I'm sorry, their hand's not stacked. It's, it's Treasure Cruise. Treasure Cruise is really good. Uh, but it also had this threat plus the Abbot of Carol Keep. They get a Tundra off Abbot of Carol Keep. Uh, this threat is uh, some sort of Shimmer, uh, Spellheart Shimmer. It's a two th or an X3 that gets uh, plus one, plus zero for each. Its power is equal to instant and sorcery cards to your graveyard. That's pretty nice. Uh, they pump up their Abbot of Carol Keep and get to draw a card off Shadow Rift. Get a bunch of damage in on me. I'm down to 15. I play out the Horizon Canopy, draw with the Horizon Canopy, uh, cast Dromo's Command to blow up one of their prowess threats and get in there for four myself, putting them down to 12. They mental note here. Uh, Lightning Bolt here, getting back the Spellheart Shimmer, which is kind of a problem because that thing's got a, a pretty big booty on it, and it's going to be a decent-sized card. They also get off Treasure Cruise. Treasure Cruise was, like, the real problem card. Um, I could r realistically take it with the uh, Tide Hollow Scholar, because I figured it would just get killed, um, you know, at some point. I guess I could have taken it, but at the time, it didn't seem that relevant. Um, I kind of wanted to out-tempo them, but here, I'm going to get... Oh, True Name's also a big problem. I can't attack anymore. Which is pretty problematic, and I draw a tapped land or tapped red land, which is kind of you know a problem with Queen Marchesa in my hand. I'm just like, oh okay, that's one of the things that's gonna happen with this deck too. Is like sometimes your mana just doesn't work out. We get chopped down to four here. Hit a thought seize, play out Queen Marchesi, um, and I believe promptly concede, or do we not promptly concede? Yeah, I probably should have attacked with my uh, Elves of Deep Shadow there to put him to ten. Uh, yeah, they have Distortion Strike, so I just go ahead and pack it in. That's it. You know, that's that's just it. So if they get the, the right threat density uh, with the right uh, volume of spells, like the, the Rug decks, I don't know what they're playing white for on Tundra and Savannah. Uh, maybe their five-color tempo. Um, but if, you know, if they get the right uh, threat density plus, um, you know, the, the rest of their spells, then the deck works out pretty well. And just here, we just kind of got out tempo. Um... You know, the mana didn't work out. We were turned slow on getting Marchesa out, which I don't know if it would have changed the math with True Name Nemesis on board. That is a tougher card to deal with. <clears throat> the deck is not stone-cold to it, though. Um, it definitely has um, 
uh, Zealous Persecution, um, as well as Liliana to template against uh, True Nemesis, and that just has a bunch of flyers and and or like Planeswalkers that that give flying, i.e. Elspeth Knight Ron, to kind of beat around True Nemesis. But it is a card that in the in the world in which it exists, you do have to plan around it. And uh, this draw was just, was not good versus True Name Nemesis. Um, you know, it was not good against some of their their early aggression that just chipped us down. So, anyways, you know, we lose this second game uh, against MTG Shark on five color tempo, and we go into game three. Quick pause, guys. We'll be back momentarily. Alrighty, guys. So we're back. Uh, yeah, hand looks great. Um, I mean, it's not the best, but it's got a turn one threat. It's got a bunch of burn, which the burn is going to be pretty good in this matchup, I think, because if we can just kill, like I was saying, they're like one to two threats, we can generally just win. And we have two fours, which, you know, I, I didn't need the second four, but, you know, one of those fours is going to be really good to just, you know, up, get a lot of value against them. We get smacked for a little bit of damage. I believe I just go ahead and resolve a threat here. Yeah, I play a Gideon out, put a 2-2 on the board, smack him with the Lions. I'll block with the Night Ally all day. If they want to pump and kill the Night Ally, that's fine. When they don't have burn or a way to evade, I'm kind of weirded out they played Shadow Rift there. Um, I guess they wanted to eat my 2-2, but that's fine by me. I'm just going to smack him for 5 with Gideon here. Uh, I guess I F6 do my attack step. Yep, that happens. Uh, they're short on lands. I Wasteland them here, which is also a solid draw. They go ahead and block the thing in the ice. I go ahead and burn that off. I'm not going to play else, but this turn I'll play it next turn as surprise damage. You know, if, I, if they get a blocker down, but they get stuck on their essentially colorless land at this point and just have to pack it in. That's also one of the issues with like filter lands and like multicolored decks that um that require to or want to cast a lot of spells is that oftentimes you know if they're cantrip heavy decks, these lands are just really awkward. Um, you know, I play them in like three color controlish decks. But any tempo-based deck, I think, wants to generally eschew the filter lands because they're just so mana-intensive to get working. And they also require you to cast spells, like, simultaneously or, like, in the same step, which is also awkward. Like, if you're trying to cast, like, you know... Like, for instance, like, let's say you have a mountain... Let's say you have two mountains and a Cascade Bluffs, and you want to cast a Preordain, but you have a counter spell in your hand. Like, you know, it puts you in a really awkward spot, right? Because, you know, maybe you need to leave up the counter spell on their turn. You know, maybe you need to cast the Preordain now. You know, so I, I tend to... Th I mean, they're good lands, don't get me wrong. And in some decks, I think in more controlling decks, they're fine. But I, I refuse to even run it in this deck. Like, I think if I was to run one in the deck that I'm currently running, I would run the uh, the white-green one. Um, and excuse me for not remembering the name of it, but I don't play them that often. Uh, but I would probably play that card is like, the only filter land if I was going to run it in the deck that I'm currently playing. Because white and green tend to be the base colors of this. Go figure, Celestia mid-range. You know, it, it's basically kind of like, you know, the base deck of what this morphed into. Um... But, you know, I, I'm just... I, I feel like oftentimes, like, these lands, you know... Especially if you're running a more land light variant... Just can tend to be stranded doing nothing for you... Or just making colorless widgets. Anyways, guys, that was the end of this game against MTG Shark... On Multicolor Tempo, um, or Aggro Control. Um, you kind of got to see some of the power of, of Four Color Blood here... Against, like, the Tempo strategies. And I, I think, in general, like, Aggro does just beat Tempo. Um, because we're not a pure mid-range deck... I don't think we're going to have as many issues against them... Because we just have efficient threats that are just hard to counter... Or they play on... on on the same timetable. The Tempo's threats will, but we just have a greater density of threats as well. Um, so if we kill their threats, like, generally, there's a lot of cards we can just strand in their hands, or in their hand. And they're going to tend to have more dead cards, right? So anyways, quick pause, guys. We'll be back for the next game in this series of matches. All right, guys, we are back, and yeah, this hand is not great, but like I was saying, like so this is a five lander, which is a lot of lands for this deck. It's not a great keep, but the reason that I do end up keeping this, and now I don't have mana confluence in my deck, now that would be a palace jailer. Uh, but the reason I keep this is because it's able to cast its spells, right? And like I was saying, like sometimes you'll keep worse hands in this deck because you're gonna draw better. Like you're gonna like all of your cards just kill people or do really relevant stuff. They're just all really good. Um, and I'm just jamming into them right now, and eventually I'm expecting they're going to run out of cards. The way that we get burned doing this is if they get, like, a multi-for-one card, like Ancestral Recall or Dig Through Time or something like that. But forcing them to uh, to interact with us every turn, in general, is not that bad. I fight a Caracas. Caracas is obviously a pretty... If you've not even played against Leovold before, Caracas is a bad answer to Leovold. I'm just going to go ahead and Fatal Push the Leovold right now. Give them one card off of it. Um, I now have two threats on board, so I'm not feeling horrible about this game. They go ahead and pass it. So ev evidently they're either on all interaction or, you know, 
I don't know, or lands, but more than likely they just have a lot of counter spells in hand and we just managed to resolve some of our threats. They go ahead and attempt to, or not attempt, they remove successfully with Assassin's Trophy our Raging Ravine, which, you know, isn't great, but it's also not horrible. We just smack him with Thalia. Um, I leave the birds in hand. I think, you know, there's more equity in leaving these cards in my hand because they can't get to rest. Um, I am going to play that Luxon Smiter, though. I mean, if they do have a two-for-one, like a, a Wrath effect, then it kind of stinks, but I want to make them dead as fast as I can. They Mystical Teachings here. I forget what they find. They find a Doomblade. So they just kill my elephant. That's fine. You know, it decreases the clock on them. But again, I'm still going to draw really relevant cards. Or I'm going to draw lands. This is back when the, the deck was running 34 lands. So it did get more draws like this where it flooded. And this is part of, the, you know, the, this series of games is actually a, a big in a big way, you know, why I um, why I made the changes to the deck. Because I got draws like this. And I did keep a five land hand. It was a very land heavy hand. Um, you know, which I'm not suggesting is, is 100% correct. But I do think that um, on Moto specifically, like... Your next six is not per se going to be better, and that hand did have a very powerful three and a four. Um, and I have a lot of faith in this deck's ability to top deck because it just runs such good cards. Some games, it doesn't work out. Like, when you draw Land of War Elves here. We get negated here, it's fine. I'm just going to swing in there. They can block. I'll eat their bird. Yep. I actually do have to play the Elves on here. I possibly should have held them. They go ahead and try to do this. I just get my Thalia back. If they have Discard, they can get rid of Thalia now. They cast an Tireless, a Tracker. Get to get a bunch of clues. I'm kind of in a weird spot because I am landing out here. I'm flooding like really bad here. Um, I'm not, I can't remember if I win or lose this game. Uh, they cast a Logic Knot. That's cool. I lose my dude, or my Thalia. And now they have a Tireless Tracker with a bunch of clue tokens. They have, I believe, one time counter left on the Suspend card, too. Uh, they just start drawing cards. They're probably looking for counter magic. I find a, a Gideon. I play this land out untapped. Just to play around, like, Mana Leak plus, like, Miscalc plus Force Spike. Like, it's just something crazy that I can't think of. Or, like, a Daze combo. Like, Daze, Force Spike, you know, something. Uh, I'm tr starting to think they may be on, like, a Wilderness Reclamation deck because they play out Library of Alexandria here. They look at my hand to see I have a land. I go ahead and make another baby with Gideon. Um, I don't swing here. My plan is is to like try to like cr generate a disadvantageous or yeah a disadvantageous situation, like right now where I put the three one back in their hand and they can't replay it on the same turn cycle or they got to play it on the next turn cycle. Which do I do here? Because I don't think I'm gonna beat them on. I'm never gonna beat them on cards. I mean they're like over ten cards ahead of me right now. I'm gonna beat them on tempo. So they demonic tutor here. I don't know for what. Evidently something they're not gonna play right now. But now I have lethal on board, right? So I go ahead and play Winter Roar about first. This has got to be a spooky card. because so this resolves... Yeah, yeah, so this... So what their plan had been is to tap down my dudes. Um, I The reason I did this first, the Winter Orb, is because if they did find Cryptic Command, which is probably what they found, then what I can do is um, not activate the Gideon and make him a creature and play the Winter Orb, force him to counter it, and then... Um, and then just make another, you know, then get my attack in with him so he's not tapped. Um, the cool thing is I'm able to do Krakus tricks with him. I actually push him back to my hand and replay him to make another baby after he's attacked and put, you know, and force them to uh, throw their uh, tireless tracker uh, in front of the bus. And they're just out of gas. So they're out of answers. They don't have an answer to Gideon here. And he just, you know, smashes them down. Um, so despite them being ahead, you know, almost 20 cards, whatever this is, you know, 20, 62, vice, 76 cards. You know, it was just, it was the last four. It was just the last card that, that, that resolved, you know, just ended up getting them. And Gideon does his job here and just, you know, takes uh, takes poor Mox a million Pegasus to Pound Town. Anyways, guys, quick break, and I'll be back for game number two in this match set against Rug, or I'm sorry, Bug. Um, it may be Bug Reclamation, because, like, it may be. I don't know. I don't know if this is Bug Reclamation. Maybe, maybe Jer started a thing. Um, anyways, guys, quick pause. I'll be back momentarily for game number two. Alrighty, guys, back. Um, yeah, hands fine. Uh, three lands. So this this deck does tend to want to keep a little more landed hands, like I was kind of saying. Like you generally want three. Three is a pretty ideal opener with this this deck, um, just because of the wide array of fixing you may need. Now, like two with a, a couple dorks is actually pretty good too. Um, you know, but you know, I I know like that may be heresy to some folks to keep like you know three and four landers. Um, a lot of folks would actually think that. But I actually think it tends to work out better with this style of deck. I think this this deck want, is a little more mana-hungry, and it's very color-hungry. Uh, see a gross spiral here? So yeah, I'm pretty sure now Mox is playing uh, Jer's List, or a list of his own that he's devised based on um, the uh, the Wilderness Reclamation deck that Jer was running. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get countered here, but I'm just going to slam something. 
Probably the butcher. Yeah, slamming it. Just saying, hey, have it. And they do. I mean, they're going to have it. Um, actually, no, I knew they didn't have it because I got rid of the condescend. So I knew they had to draw it that turn. That's why I did it. That makes a lot of sense. So they, I basically said, hey, have a, have a counter spell. Have drawn a counter spell on your last turn or just get beat the hell down by a 5 4. Play out the Pride Mage here. At this point, the jig's up. They are playing Bug Reclamation. So I figure I'm in a pretty good spot, you know. And But if I if they do manage to resolve the Reclamation next turn, I can blow it up on their turn. Play out a Grim Flare. Uh, they go for the Throat the Flare, which means they probably don't have Mass Removal. I just play out a Scavenging Ooze and get in there. They cannot flare up the Lumbering Falls here. It looks like they're a little mana short as it stands. And they just go ahead and pack it in. Yeah, if they didn't hit a land drop that turn, they're probably really dead. I'm probably just going to end up resolving a Liliana of the Veil and just start hammer fisting their hand. Or, you know, if I draw a land, especially a fetch land, I'll just Vindicate plus Liliana, which is just it's, it's horrendous because they'll probably counter the, the Vindicate, uh, which means that I can then land the Liliana and just start, like, you know, knocking their hand apart. Um, so, anyways, you know, you see this game play out. And actually, this is a game. I'm probably going to cover this matchup, actually, again, I think, during this. Cause I think I played Jer again. Uh, but one of the, the matchups you saw um, in the first video was was against Bug Reclamation, piloted by Jeremy White. And I actually think that matchup's favored towards my deck. Um, I think the 4C Basta variants are probably a little better against his deck. I mean, I think in general, like, decks that run, like, you know, a bazillion one-drops are probably a little tougher for decks like Wilderness Reclamation to beat. Um... Well, maybe not, because he does have a lot of, like, good control elements for, like, uh, multi for wanting them. And that was kind of one of the arguments I made against, like, the Basta list. Not that I don't think Basta, the Basta list is, like, 100 times better against combo, which is most certainly, like, one of the big considerations for why he slammed the deck so far down. Um, you know, but I think in general, like, even this build is pretty favored against, you know, this style of deck. Like, I, I feel like it's very attritional, and I feel like it's generally, like, um, you know, like a 2-1 two, two, game, like, you know, like, so, you know, generally speaking, if it's a, if it's a match set, I feel like it's generally like a 2-1 split uh, between both decks, but I feel like it's slightly edge advantage towards the four-color deck versus, like, the, the Bug Reclamation deck. Um, just been my play experience with it, but obviously, like, you know, two two different lists, you know, and I haven't jammed the matchup, like, 50 times to really be able to really tell, but that's kind of been how it's played out uh, when I've jammed it. So anyways, guys, quick pause, and we'll be on to the next match. All right, guys, we're back, and we're playing against uh, Amius Milan here. They play on a Tolarian Academy, or Tolarian West, which means to me, when playing against Academy, I'm playing against Storm or Academy. And if it's Storm, they didn't really keep an opener they tend to probably like. So they don't play a second land, and I'm like, oh, no. Which means that they're probably on Academy, and they probably have a bunch of, like, uh, Signets in hand. My hand was actually kind of slower, too. I mean, it did have an Abrupt Decay on turn two, um... But they finally hit their second land, which is Academy Runes. The jig's up. They're definitely on an Academy list. I'm just going to slam my Huntmaster. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to play on a Kasali Pride Mage, and I'm going to Abrupt Decay their uh, Mana Rock, which I actually like that better than slamming the Huntmaster. I like just putting them back. So if they kept that hand, it's probably very powerful once it gets to higher mana. I just play out the Gruul Spellbreaker here, slam in. I pop the Kasali Pride Mage before EOT, blow up their, uh, their Talisman, and say, hey, you know, make it happen, um, but they're unable to make it happen from four. And that's kind of like one of the things, I mean, this is a, a strong combo deck my opponent's playing, but if they stumble at all, like, you just smash their eyelids shut so quick. We also have cards like Gaddock Teague, which I could have played this in this last turn cycle, but I kind of figured it was just better to put them on a big clock um, and just kill them um, as opposed to playing Gaddock out, which, you know, may or may not have been wrong, but, you know, they have a couple relevant cards that Gaddock just hoses, like um, War of Invention and, like, uh, Time Spiral. But they also have a lot of cards that don't really matter. Gaddick doesn't really do that much again, so I think it's just better just to kill them quickly. That's what we end up doing here. And we also still have a backup Artifact Destroyer. So now the deck actually has a lot of answers to Artifacts. It's got Abrupt Decay, it's got Assassin's Trophy, it's got Kasali Pride Mage, it's got Knight of Autumn, it's got a Braid now. Um, I think it may have more, but it just you know has a lot of ways to answer kind of like permanents that historically have been problematic for, for mid-range decks. Uh, but it's kind of able to get after that. You kind of see, you know, they stumble in this game, so, like, it's not really a great game from a gameplay perspective. But it kind of shows some of the power against combo, too. Like, if they stumble at all, like, the deck can just run them over really quick. Uh, probably not as fast as, like, an all-one-drops variant of it, like the Boston variants, but it doesn't have a bad game plan against that. So quick pause, guys, and we'll come back for the next game in this match, and hopefully we have a little bit more of a game than this one was. All right, guys, we are back for this next game against um, Academy. They play on an Avengers Fair, 
but nothing else. So I'm not too upset about that. I get to go ahead and inquisition them on turn one, take a look at their hand. Uh, so, quick pause, and we'll go over their hand and why I took what I took. So their hand consists of a Rings of Birth Hearth, which, you know, is the most powerful card in that hand. Um, what I end up taking is one of the Manor Rocks. So I'm going to try to out-tempo them here. I have a Coligan's Command, and I'm actually going to probably use the Coligan's Command to blow up the Demir Signet, unless things get way out of hand really quick, like they draw like a Mana Crypt or something like that. Uh, then maybe I'll blow up the Rings of Birth, uh, Birth Hearth because it's a big high payoff card. Uh, but my plan is is to like actually allow them to play out their Signet, blow up their Signet, force them to discard, and then just like slam slam a Gideon or an Anafenza and just shut you know close close the game out. So they go ahead and play out their Signet. I draw pretty much the Goat, the best card in my deck. Now I could try to go for a Coligan's Command this turn, but I opt just to like pressure them as hard as I can. Um, I'm going to probably just blow up an artifact next turn as opposed to applying more pressure, because this is probably enough pressure. This is essentially 7 power on the next turn. Uh, they go ahead and play out a 4-drop here, which is just Thran Dynamo. Play out the Rings of Birth Hearth. Um, I'm just going to blow up the Thran Dynamo here. I think it's actually more relevant. I just go ahead and blow up the uh, Thran, get the Buried Rune out of their hand, play out another Dork, and slam in there for 7. And I believe, if they're not dead next turn, they're very close to dead. I have a Winter Orb, so actually, no, what I do here is I'm going to wait for them to activate their Inventor's Fair, um, you know, either during combat or, you know, if they don't do it during my turn, like during my, my formal part of my turn, then I'll just play the uh, the Winter Orb out, uh, second main, uh, to tie up all of their mana. So they do end up finding a Mana Vault. They have an Upheaval in hand that we know about. They draw into a Mistress Workshop for the turn, but they're one mana short from casting Upheaval due to the Winter Orb, um, and we just kill them. Uh, that's kind of the plan. This deck's plan against combo is just kill them quick. Like it has a pretty good disruption suite, especially against you know you saw artifacts. Um, has pretty decent hand attack, and just a fast clock. That's just it. You know, at the end of the day, just fast clock. Um, but they're also cards that I think in general tend to scale pretty well um, against control as well. Because like Anafenza is just it's business, right? Like you know you see an Anafenza, it's a four four for three, and it makes your other crappier threats better. Um, so generally speaking, they want to just get rid of it. Um, it's just as a single card. Uh, so, I think it scales a little better, you know, but it also can do some good work. Now, it's probably a turn slower against combo than, like, the more aggressive builds, uh, which is a liability, but I still do think we have a decent game against it, and you kind of get to see that showcased here um, against this uh, this Academy deck. Alright, guys, quick pause. We'll be back for the next game. Alright, guys, back. Uh, so, this hand's a keeper. Um, it's probably going to have to find Badlands with the, uh, the Arid Mesa. Uh, but, you know, it's got a decent 2-drop. It's got, you know, it's it's going to play a turn 1 tap land. Uh, it's got Abrupt Decay if we need to go that route. Um, I don't know what MTG Shark's going to be playing, but this hand's fine. Like, it's got a little bit of everything going on. It wants to draw more lands. And it does. I think I probably should have sequenced out one of the fetch lands here. Um, just to increase, you know, if I drew, like, a double black card or something like that, I think it could have been more relevant. Um, I instantly blow up this uh, Sapphire Medallion. I know that at this point, they are likely on uh, High Tide. They evidently do not have land. So I think here, what I end up doing is just firing up the uh, Stirring Wildwood. I kind of want them to tap low again, because like if they kept a two-lander with just Sapphire Medallion... My guess is they probably have like really good... They either have a lot of counter magic, or they have a really good hand. Um... Like, a lot of counter spells. Uh, they peer through depths, but peer through depths cannot find land, recall, or remember. So, it can only find instants and sorcery. Or, it can fi only find non-lands, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, instant or sorcery. I'm sorry. Only instant or sorcery. So, it cannot find lands, even though it looks at a ton of cards. Uh, but here, you know, they just don't find that land they need uh, to make this powerful hand work. Um, I actually don't extend further in the board, because I figure, you know, like, mana drain... Like, they're probably not playing mana drain, but, like, if they are, like, it could be a really big blowout here. Um... So don't let that happen to myself. I just, you know, clock them down with my onboard presence. And it works. You know, it just gets them dead. Anyways, guys, quick... Oh, one interesting note. So Winter Orb, you know, actually, interestingly, is kind of mitigated by the High Tide deck. Like, they generally don't start tapping out until it's, like, really time to go. Um, and when they do, they have a lot of untapping effects. So sometimes Winter Orb is not the best against High Tide. Um, but it's also not terrible. Like, if they counter, like, a, a two- or three-drop spell and you just drop an orb, like, generally speaking, you just ride out your uh, your board presence to victory against them. So, anyways, guys, quick pause. We'll be back for game number two in this match set. All right, guys, welcome back. Um, So, game two. Hand's fine. You know, it's got some hand attack. It's got, you know, some redundant threats in it. Um, it's got some mana acceleration. It's got basically the trappings of a great hand. I play out Noble Hierarch first. They play out a slight... I find Gaddick, which is quite powerful. 
I go ahead and throw a Gaddock out there. They unfortunately do have the Spell Snare. I probably should have thought Seized here, but I think what I wanted to do is actually play the Birds out this turn. And if I draw next turn, like, still be able to play Bloodbraid Elf and apply pressure to them. But, you know, Thoughtseize could have been better here. <clears throat> when I draw into a powerful three, I just opt to Thoughtseize them here. I do get the Merchant Scroll out of their hand, meaning they're going to have to Flood of Recollection on the following turn. Play out my 4-4, four, four, Knight of the Reliquary, which, you know, they unfortunately, you know, they did fetch her another Black Source. I kind of wanted to be able to... Oh, they drew it at Treasure Cruise. Treasure Cruise kind of turns my game plan sideways. I feel like the game's going pretty well for me right now. Uh, but what I opt to do is actually just blow up one of their lands to keep them on lower land capacity. They do spell Pierce here. I mean, I just cast to get the Pierce out of their hand. I don't think Pierce is going to be that relevant in this game. And I have a lot of pressure on them. So the Flood of Recollection, the Merchant Scroll, get back the High Tide. Uh, now, it really depends on what they drew, because like the rest of their hand didn't really combo that well with High Tide. Um, you know, So it depends on what they drew. If they drew into like a Time Spiral, we're in some trouble here. <clears throat> and unfortunately, they Dark Pet and Time Spiral. So they drew into what they needed to there, uh, but kind of had pretty two live draws. <coughs> that's alright, that's how that's how the deck should run. I mean, it, you know, if it if it gets the draws, it's going to win. They Meditate here, we're pretty sure we're dead. They have Cloud of Fae, which is a little annoying, but, you know, it, it's... At this point, like, it's if they have it, we just lose. They have Mystical Teachings, and I'm pretty sure now nah, I'm just dead. Um, they just turn about, untap, they can recast Mystical Teachings, find... Oh, they just have Aether... Aether or Reservoir Flux. So I'm not going to remember all these games, because it's a lot of games over a few days. Uh, Re Reservoir is probably enough. They cast Mind's Desire. I just concede here, I think. I don't think I'd make them go through this. So we get Mind's Desire now. Um, do I make them go through it? No, I don't. There's no way I do. Yeah, yeah I just concede. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd be that kind of guy to make them go through a Mind's Desire. Like, I'm very dead to Aether Flux Reservoir, uh, even though they're three. So pretty close game. You know, they had some pretty good draws there near the end. They had, like, a couple sequences of draws that were really necessary for them to lock up the game. Um, you know, and that's kind of one of the liabilities of the deck is sometimes when combo has its really strong draws, if it doesn't have to like kind of you know work for it real hard, um, then you can just lose. But um, you know, that's where like dropping the curve down even lower, you know, I think kind of helps you out a little bit against combo decks. But you know, in general, I think you know if they have to do a more medium, if they have a more medium draw, uh, like median draw, like you know their their seventieth percentile draws. Then in general, I think we're going to be fast enough just to get them. Um, as you can see, this is really close, you know. But uh, you know, by the end of it, it's not going to be close at all. We're going to die, you know, horribly because this thing is going to easily put them up to like a hundred plus life. All right, guys, quick break, and we'll be back momentarily for the next game in these matches. Alrighty, guys, we're back for game number three against MTG Shark on High Tide Combo. Uh, this hand's perfectly acceptable. We're playing against basically a mono blue deck that is splashing black for Yagmoth's Will, Demonic Tutor, and uh, Tendrils of Agony. So their removal suite's going to be really low, and I think Bob's going to be able to run away with the game. So I get a Dark Confident out on turn one off of a uh, Power Assist from Mox uh, um, Pearl. Join a Wasteland here. Wasteland, meh, not the most relevant here. Just play out a Deathrite Shaman attacking for two. Got a Wasteland for the draw of Bob, which is not really great. I'd actually rather not have Wasteland right now. Uh, I am able to draw into um, some uh, some more mana here, though. And Wasteland will scale well over time. I actually just use the DRS for uh, more mana and put a, four additional power on the board and get rid of my opponent's search for his Kanta. They do have a, a Candelabra of Thanos. Uh, they play out the, the Cloud of Fae here, likely just a block to safeguard their life total, but it's actually going to make the Fatal Push, which is normally a dead card in this matchup, decently live in my hand. i just go ahead and Fatal Push that, play out the Emerald, uh, get rid of their Cloud of Fae to uh, reduce their Delve count. I didn't need to do that on my main, but I kind of wanted to F6. Uh, I'll go ahead and smack them for a lot. They play on a land, uh, I believe... Yeah, play out Chase the Vine Sculptor, bounce the Scoozy. Uh, but it's down to two, so I can just attack it with one of my uh, two power things. And now I'm going to start leaving DRS up to get rid of, like, Preordains and stuff like that. I may just do it right now. I do just play out the Tireless Tracker. I'd rather safeguard, or save the Luxon Smiter for a turn when they opt to leave up mana. Um, I do just get Ponder on my turn for F6 value. Although, I, I recognize in real life I would just, you know, do it on their turn. Uh, you know, uh, maybe not. I mean, it depends on... I have to really count the mana and see what the possibilities were for a dig through time, but it didn't look very possible. Anyways, you kind of get to see, you know, what happens when they're on their median draw. We just kind of power through them here. Um, we also had a pretty solid opener with the Dark Confidant off of uh, Mox on turn one. Like, getting a two-drop down when, you know, they, you know they're you know they on the, the draw 
um, on turn one is, is very powerful, especially one like Bob, where it's just a card engine. And my life total does not matter that much at all in this matchup. Um, I would say, like, the only card that maybe it's a little bit relevant against in High Tide is, um, gosh, I can't think of it, Sentinel Tower. Sentinel Tower, you know, could be a little bit relevant, but in general, I think on this board, Sentinel Tower would try to wipe out my creatures. Um, I can't, yeah, I can wipe out creatures. Um, before it would try to wipe out my life total. Um, that said, you know, this is a very fast start for High Tide, um, or against High Tide, and they kind of just get buried in the uh, in the tempo advantage of, uh, of all of these little cards that we're playing here. So anyways, guys, uh, quick pause. We'll be back for the next game in this uh, series. All right, guys, we're back. Playing against, against MTG Shark. This hand's acceptable. It's not really anything exciting. Um, it's a decent hand against mid-range, you know. Uh, it's got some interaction for two. It doesn't really have a good, you know, sp like fast start with a dork. But, you know, it's got a few things going on. Opponent's out of three cards at this point. We are again playing against their tempo deck. So now I'm not too upset with this hand because it's got the early interaction in the form of Lightning Helix. I drew the Dork, of course, this turn, which, you know, that's sometimes how Mana Dorks work out. You know, they're a little bit of higher variance cards. Um, but now I get to power out, you know, uh, this um, Gruel Spellbreaker. Put a plus one, plus one counter on it because I think just having a bigger dude is going to be better. Um, and it looks like they're very short on threats. So... If they're short on threats, like, a lot of their cards just aren't going to work that well. You see cards like Colossal Might, and they probably have Mutagenic Growth and stuff like that. I just play out the Knight of Autumn as a 4-3, and play out the Avacyn's Pilgrim. And Cinderay gets tossed at one of my, my cards, it's fine. Um, don't really care if I lose a Knight of Autumn here. Draw another removal spell, which is great. Like, generally speaking, like, having, like, one to two removal spells against these style of decks is good, because if you blow up their threats, like, it tends to just end the game for them. They cast a Gaia's Might on my, uh, on my, my Falcon Wrath Aristocrat, because they're just like, yeah, what can I do? And they lightning bolt themselves to death. I appreciate your style, MTG Shark. Uh, you know, uh, well, I can see when you can, when you can perform Sapuko. <laughs> I can appreciate that, on his own terms. Anyways, guys, we'll pause. We'll be back for game number two against, uh, Rug Tempo here, momentarily. Alrighty, guys, we're back. <clears throat> yeah, hand was not good. It had one land. This hand is fine. It's got a threat removal and mana ramp. And it's got a wasteland. So, eh, can't complain. Um, I probably should have considered leading on the Polluted Delta, but the problem with that is I'm not going to be able to get red mana with it if I want to play the Noble Hierarch on turn one. So I went with this line with the basic forest. Um, I, of course, draw another fetch land, so I could have made that line. It wouldn't matter that much. But I really want to be able to uh, play out the Doran on turn two if I wanted to. What I have to do instead is just blow up their threat. They play out a uh, Spellheart Shimmer here. I just play out the Tide Hollow Sculler as opposed to the Doran. Take a look at their hand. Uh, their hand, so a quick pause. I'll go over their hand real quick. So their hand consists of a Stormtaster Mage, uh, Quarian Dryad, Hooting Mandrels, and Vines of the Fastwood. Um, what I end up taking is the Stormtaster Mage. It's kind of funny because I think Stormtaster Mage is actually the best card against Doran in their hand. And the Quarian Dryad is not really looking to be that great anytime soon. So I go ahead and attack in with the uh, Noble Hierarch here. Uh, trying to see if I can play chicken with them and just get my free point of damage in. They actually got about to block, so one thing, just lesson, you know, just don't get bullied. Um, I, I probably bullied them a little bit there with that play, and I don't think I could have gotten punished I knew their hand pretty exactly. They cast a bunch of spells and pump up their, uh, their spell heart, or their, yeah, their spell heart, Shimra. Uh, get the career and dry it down. I blow up their red mana because they look to be choked on red mana looking at their hand. Not that it's going to uh, preclude them from playing things now, but they probably have a lot of burn spells in their deck. And I would prefer to keep their burn spells uh, shut off. I do get a Collective Brutality. I discard the rest of the lands in my hand, because I don't really need more lands to play the game of Magic here. I can cast every spell in my deck with what I currently have. I do get in 6 damage off of Doran because of the trigger off Noble Hierarch. Uh, I go ahead and slam it with all. They end up blocking the Doran here and then using uh, Vines of the Vastwood uh, kicked to kill my Doran, but they're down to 1 at this point, which puts them in a very dubious spot. Um... They attack with their threat here. I assume they probably have an answer. If I try to attack with everything, I'm pretty sure I'm going to die. Or not die, but I'm going to lose. A th I'm going to lose a threat for free, basically. They do play on a Terramander here. Um, attack for four. Put me down to four. And they're looking at a pretty good spot right now. But I draw the bolt, right? I go ahead and play this land out. Um, and one of the little tricky things I did is I actually tapped white and red on my last turn, and then like played like I was going to go to their upkeep to try to cast a burn spell on them, but then, like, acted like I was trying to play around counter magic. That's just some head games bullcrap, um, you know, but at the end of the day, I do get lucky and draw the bolt. I end up just casting the bolt here. They show me the vapor snag, um, and kill themselves with their own vapor snag. Um, so yes, if I had tried to attack into them, they would have got me with vapor snag. I did not know about that card, but the way they had played it by attacking there made me very strongly believe that they had the ability to answer my threats. I did not think they would leave themselves dead. I figured it was probably vapor snag or possibly, um, 
possibly withdraw or possibly uh, Simic Charm. Um, uh, Simic Charm and Vapor Snag were the most likely, so that's why I didn't attack the turn prior. Um, they definitely did not have Counter Magic, or their Counter Magic was conditional um, on mana here. And off of the Lotus Cobra trigger here, I'm able to cast Bolt and just get them to zero, or I would have been able to get them to like negative two, but they, they go ahead and Vapor Snag themselves first. Anyways, guys, quick pause. We'll be back for the next game in these match sets. Um, you know, pretty interesting matchup against Tempo. I do think it is edge favor towards the uh, the four color blood deck or four color mid range aggro deck, uh, just because I think it's card quality is a little bit higher um, in general, and it has lower card synergy. I.e., there are a lot of cards in the tempo decks, well, in this style of rug tempo deck with pump spells, you know, like, Become Immense is just it's utter garbage if you don't have a threat, right? It, so is, like, you know, Vines of the Vast one. If you don't have a threat, it's not good. Um, if you do, they're great, but it's more re it's a re more resource-intensive strategy. So if, like, your resources don't line up such that you have, like, X number of pump spells, X number of lands, and X number of threats to lock up the pump spells on, then you can just run into strings of dead cards that just don't do as much. Whereas, like, my plan is to, like, top deck into Gideon's. And, like, you know, Gideon's just good on his own. He doesn't really need creatures to be good. He makes creatures, you know... Not always true. I mean, I do ha assume some risk in the same way of, like, you know, with the Mana Dorks, um, you know, but at the end of the day, those are still blockers, right? They're still blockers and attackers. Not very good ones, but they still do that. So, anyways, guys, quick pause. We'll be back for the next game in this series of gameplay with Four Color Blood. All right, guys, back. So, this hand's unkeepable. It has nothing going on that's good. I keep this hand on six with a forest on top. Um, because it has a DRS, I see that I'm probably playing against Red Deck Wins or maybe Boros Aggro, and I really I don't like this hand as much anymore. <laughs> I obviously don't have to block here. Uh, they play out a 3-3 Menace, which is pretty good. I draw it a Johnny, which is a fine card. A fetch land next would have been really good. Um, I have to block here to force them to use their mana. I don't know if I like that play, but I feel like I need to get something going, or at least possibly tie up their mana in a way they can't cast a relevant threat. I missed on the following turn for land, and I think I was probably dead here regardless. Maybe I packed it in a little bit too early, but this is a pretty huge clock. I'm going to have a four-power figure of destiny that I can't deal with next turn, uh, plus three hitting me, so it's four damage, plus one off of Thermal Alchemist. I'm taking eight damage. I'm dead in two turns. And I don't think this hand can come back from that. Um, you know, possibly I shouldn't have blocked with the DRS on the following turn. The hope was there is that, one, I would top deck land and be able to cast the Renegade Rallyer, um, you know, and two, that uh, I could possibly force them off of casting something relevant by forcing them to pump the figure of destiny there. Um, so it was a... Um, you know, it was a, a high-risk, high-reward play that I made by blocking with DRS. But I thought it was kind of possibly worth it. Because I thought I had to have enough happen right to get lucky to win this game. Uh, but, like I said, it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out at all. I mean, the highest upside play was doing nothing, drawing into a fetch land. But, like, drawing into a fetch land specifically is not that unlikely, but it's also a lot less likely than just drawing any land. Um, drawing any land allows me to play the Renegade Rally out and just put a blocker, a relevant blocker down, um, or possibly cast my spells. But the problem is here, like, my mana fixing is way too off, out of whack. Like, I need a lot of black and a lot of, a lot of red sources to make this hand work, and with, you know, a two-turn clock on the board and nothing going on on my side, you know, I go for the highest risk, highest reward play, just blocking there, and maybe they actually don't pump and they just lose it, try to play a three-drop, you know, whatever. Um, but anyways, yep, end up losing that one pretty quick against red deck wins, but one of those things, you know, like, you know, you don't one, it was a mulligan to six, and two, you know, when you don't know what you're playing, like, you can't really tell how much time you got. I had no clue I was playing Red Deck Wins here, and it was definitely not a good hand against that style of deck. So, anyways, guys, quick pause. We'll be back momentarily for the next game in this match set. Alrighty, guys, we are back. Oh, that hand was unkeepable. It had one mana source and a bunch of fours. This hand is not that great, but I don't think I want to go to five against Red Deck Wins. Um, it's possible I should have. I see a Grim Flare on top. I bottom that instantly. I go ahead and play out my land untapped, taking two, play out the Scavenging Ooze, and say go. And I'm hoping to draw into a red or a black source of mana here. That's why I bottomed the creature. I see a Tattermunch Maniac. I do draw to a black source. I'm able to Fatal Push it, gain a life off of the Scavenging Ooze, slam in for three, get him to 17. They have a Fire Drink Seder and a Figure of Destiny on the following turn. Um, I do go ahead and look at their hand, get the Stroke of G or Stoke of Flame or Stoke the Flames out of their hand, slam in for a little bit of damage, uh, get them down to 14. Now I, I'm able to cast the uh, Lightning Helix next turn. They go ahead and strike in there. I go ahead and block here to eat their Fire Drink Seder. They go ahead and Fire Blast after combat. Um, I gain the additional life. I don't know, like, so I know their hand at this point. I know their hand is, actually, I don't know their last card. So they basically just burned off their lands to kill the ooze. 
um, at this point, and I'm able to get rid of the figure of Destiny so they don't have like their best permanent, uh, their best, uh, their best threat on board. I draw to an Assassin's Trophy. Now, keep in mind, this is also when I'm still at 34 lands, so I, I think you see some flooding this game, so I'm pretty sure I lose this one. So they get in for two damage here off of a box, and they're one card in hand. I draw to a land. I'm not going to play any more lands out here, guys, because I want to play around Price of Progress. I could use the Assassin's Trophy a little bit more aggressively and just blow up the Soul Scar Mage, but if they play a relevant card, like Flame of the Keld, then I'd rather just blow that up, because Flame of the Keld represents three cards on the next turn, which is just a ton um, I go ahead and Assassin's Trophy it. You know, draw step plus two is just, it's a lot of cards to see against Red Deck wins. And I think in general, like, I have a better chance of just beating the Soul Scar, or Soul Scar Mage. I've drawn into a bunch of lands at this point, though, which is not very good. Uh, I've drawn another land here, so I've drawn three lands in a row, plus an Assassin's Trophy. Um, not really holding up to its name of, you know, being a great top decking deck. Uh, I draw into a Path to Exile here. I go ahead and do it on their attack step, I want to say. I let them draw first. I actually want them to draw more lands, so I don't want to do it pre-draw step. I do take the one here, though. They go ahead and pop the Ramanap runes to hit me. Um, I play... I find an elves, so I play, play the elves out. And now I'm getting close to a point where I think I path. I don't think I path that last turn, because I was just like, that's eh, just one. The, the difference between, like, 11 and 10 is not that big against them. But the difference between 10 and 9 is pretty big. Now, I make an odd play here. They go for a Searing Blood. What I have to do is just prevent the 3 damage to myself by Path to Exiling my own Elves to get a land out of my deck. I do finally draw into a relevant card here. Um, I find Badlands with my Fetch Land, play out the Gruel Spellbreaker, making a 4-4. Four four. So, about the best of spots, about the worst of spots. Cobra's not great, but it can block, so I attack. I, do, I don't want to give them all the time in the world, so I think it is correct to attack here. Unfortunately, they have Arc Trail, which domes me down to 5. gives them a 2-power attacker. And basically now, like, the name of the game is try to fade a draw step or two. I go ahead and get 4 damage in here down to 5, and they draw Lightning Strike, I want to say. Yep, and I die. So, like, one of the issues, you know, like, you know, especially in the 34 land bill, which I'm glad I cut down, you know, flooding for 3 turns against Red Deck Wins just feels god-awful. Um... Because you're like, man, like, almost every card I can draw on my deck probably just wins, doesn't win on the spot, but, like, puts me in a very good position to continue to just, you know, accrue advantage. But, you know, when you flood like that, you know, against Red Deck wins, like, that tends to be how you lose games against them. So, this is, uh, I think the only game I've lost with this deck since I started retuning it, um... I really have to dig. I think I've only lost one game with it. I think, you know, uh, it's it's done really well against the online meta. But the cool thing is we get to get, have a rematch against uh, against Red Deck Wins here with uh, Wolfgang Cloud uh, piloting it. And hopefully, you know, um, ha have a little bit uh, luckier keeps and draws against them and, and get to get to uh, get them in the grudge match. So we'll be back momentarily for the next, uh, the next matchup, which will be Red Deck Wins uh, one more time. Alrighty, guys, we are back, so... Yeah, this hand's great um, against against Red Deck Wind style decks. It's a little slow, but it's a pretty solid hand. I actually make a, a low value fetch here because I want to just cast Inquisition on turn one. And actually, let me do this. Let me go over their hand real fast. So I look at their hand. Their hand is Incendiary Flow, Lightning Strike, Firebrand Archer, uh, Majoring Bully, uh, Two Mountains, and an Eidolon of the Great Revel. I get rid of the Eidolon because I think I'm going to try to interact with them along a curve. I don't want to give them a bunch of incidental damage. Um... That said, I have a good answer to their follow-up threat, which is likely going to either be the Firebrand Archer or the Majoring Bully. My guess would be Bully, because it's going to scale pretty well over time, because they're going to be casting Burn Spells to remove my creatures and pumping that thing with Prowess. So I just go ahead and play a land out here and say go, and expect them to probably play out the Bully. And I'm, I'm hoping to draw lands, but at this time I was playing 34, and the deck's chance of drawing lands are actually pretty high, or Mana Source is pretty high. Um, and we do. We draw a Mana Source here, which is pretty much exactly what we want to see. I go ahead and escalate. Uh, I don't gain the life because I'm not really under that much of a threat right now. I get rid of Incendiary Flow to try to set up the Kitchen Finks. If you're not familiar with Incendiary Flow, it exiles. So it's a Sorcery Speed, uh, um, Lightning Strike, or Incinerate. Uh, I do go ahead and play out the Finks here, which Finks, this is, how you're gonna, this is one of the reasons Finks is in the deck. Finks is really good against these style of decks. I gain two life. They play on an idiot. They, you know, light, uh, Flame Rift. I blow up their Firebrand Archer and get rid of Lightning Strike out of their hand with my uh, my Coligan's Command, so I get another 2-for-1. Get a 2-for-1 off Finks here. Play out the Voice of Resurgence. I attack them. And they're at 0 cards at this point, and I have a pretty great hand. They go to attack it with the Tattermunch, because they have to. Tattermunch always, only knows the battle. 
I get a, an elemental here. They go ahead and, I believe, play on a threat and also use Barbering to kill my uh, elemental token, um, possibly in response to me casting out this Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. Yep, they go ahead and pop the elemental. I attack with both, I want to say. No, I leave back a blocker. I respect Red Deck wins. I probably should have just attacked with Finks there. Because I don't block. That's Yeah, that was a bad play on my part. I should have just, uh, should have just attacked with it. I find Queen Marchese, which I just go ahead and slam. I believe I only... Yeah, I only hit them with these two. Because I don't think it makes a relevant difference on clock, and because I couldn't kill that very turn, I could put them to one. And Falcon Wrath Aristocrat's very hard for Red Deck Wins to deal with. I just block, sack the Finks. If they kill, try to kill it in response, I'll sack the other thing and make it invulnerable. And if they have another one, then I'll just play another threat. I'll play a Doran out, and they're still, you know in a world of hurt, even though they've wiped my board with a couple burn spells. Um, that said, you know, we kind of get him in this game one. You know, we have a lot of two-for-one advantage cards. You know, we have Collective Brutality, which I assume, I, I kind of uh, play as a, as a um, uh, in this matchup as a two-for-one advantage card. Colgan's Command, two-for-one advantage. Voice of Resurgence, two-for-one advantage. Kitchen Vinks, two-for-one advantage. Queen Marchessa, two-for-one advantage. I mean, you know, you say it over and over and over again, like, you just, you, you grind them out. Like, and that's what we did here. I mean, we're still at 13 life, and they really haven't had uh, good effectiveness against, you know, our threats and answers that we have that tend to eat up a lot more of their cards that are less economic. You know, they're more efficient, but they're less economic. Anyways, guys, quick break, and we'll be back for the next game in this match. All right, guys, back for match two against Red Deck Wins. Um, that hand was not good. That the hand could stumble on mana. I want a hand that is not going to stumble on mana against them. I want to have good early, good mana progression against this deck. Um, so, I'm fine with this hand. It's got a turn one mana dork. If it doesn't get burned off, then I have the ability to draw into a three and possibly cast it. They cast out a Kari Sev. What I end up doing here is just blowing up the Kari Sev. They cast out a Zergo, and I guess fail to attack. Uh, I don't think it makes a difference in this game. I start playing on a bunch of dummies. I attack for two with my Land of War Elves. Smack them down to 17. I believe I just trade them. No, I don't trade them yet. I draw into... A bomb four. That's kind of what the deck's designed to do, is just draw into its bomb fours. Draw into Elsbeth Knight of Rot here, and just make a dude. Um, go ahead and Alpha Strike in with, or just strike in with the, uh, not Alpha Strike, I strike in with the uh, Scrap Heaps Crowner, because he cannot block. He knows only the battle. They go and attack in. I go ahead and double block and block. I'm just going to trade them resources here. They have a Brute Force, cool. Like, I'll trade the Kasali Pride Mage for, you know, Brute Force. They have a... A Sulfuric Vortex, which I think is a very daring play, because I'm just going to race the living hell out of them. I'm going to slam in for six and just say, hey, kill me with your one card. Um, you know, if you draw, like, Price of Progress, you could definitely get me here. Put me down to 11, going down to nine off of Sulfuric Vortex. Draw to Winter Orb, kind of a dead draw. I force them to use this. I'm not going to pump the... Uh, Pump with the Elsbeth. I put a Soldier Token into play to block on this following turn. And I can also bring back Scrappy Heap Scrounger, which is going to mean they have to remove it again. Uh, I go ahead and put Scrappy Boy into play. Back or Down to 7 at this point. Attack in. They have a Shard Volley. Blow up Scrappy Boy. Put a 1-1 into play. Drop the Fleece Main Lion, which is another 3-3 three, three they got to deal with. They're down to 1. They don't draw you know, multiple cards they need to kill me. And they go ahead and pack it in. Um, so it's kind of, I think in general, I think this is not a disadvantaged matchup, but, you know, one of the things against Red Deck Wins, or against, you know, most combo decks, I tend to consider Red Deck Wins as more of a combo-ish deck, it, it almost plays in that way, um, is that, you know, if you, if you stumble, uh, you know, like, I.E. Mulligan a bunch, um, especially when you're not using the Sorensen Mulligan rule, where it's a lot easier to kind of get, um, good hands for a matchup. But if you stumble a lot, uh, especially on mana, you're going to have these issues um, against them, and they're just going to get you sometimes. That's why I say Red Deck just wins. Because <laughs> um, sometimes it does. And I, I do think this is a very favorable matchup for, for the build that I've got. But we did get had by it. You know, it just sometimes it just gets you. Um, but anyways, you know, pretty pretty cool games against Red Deck wins. Um, I kind of got to showcase, you know, one, you know, like Red Deck sometimes just wins. Um, you know, even in that second game where I thought we were probably highly advantaged post uh, Fire Blast on Scavenging Use, and I don't—I'm not saying it was the wrong play. I just feel like I was very advantaged when they had to go down to one mana resource, basically on a Hellbent hand with one card that we didn't know in hand. Uh, I felt pretty good about that. Uh, but you know, if you top deck, you know, three to four lands in a row, you know, you're going to be in a bad spot. You know, especially because like most of their spells are going to be castable on one. Um, you know, when they have cards like you know Rakdos Cacklers and and Goblin Guides and Jackal Pups and Zergo Bell Strikers. 
So anyways, that was the Red Duck wins matchup. You kind of got to see both sides of it. Um, and I think more often than not, it's going to play out more so like the second time. Um, you know, but some, some bad mulligans, uh, you know, one, one, one mulligan in game one where we just didn't know the matchup and we mulliganed into a hand that was probably fine against a lot of stuff, but not against this. And then, you know, unfortunate mulligan into kind of an unfortunate, uh, flood out, um, uh, in the mid game where we just, you know, lost us some flood out. So anyways, guys, quick break and we'll be back for the next game in these series of game plays with, uh, Four Color Blood. All right, guys, back, playing against Maximilian Pegasus again. This hand's acceptable. It's got, you know, three mana sources, well, four mana sources with the Land of War Elves. We're going to have possibly a turn to uh, Tireless Tracker. One liability it does have is it's not running, it doesn't have black mana yet, uh, which is, you know, a little bit uh, annoying. Uh, Thalia was a pretty decent draw, uh, but I'm going to play out the Tireless Tracker to get value off it this turn. Uh, likely, they're going to try to remove it this turn. But I already got a card out of it, so I'm kind of fine with them casting a Fire Ice on it and just getting my value. Trying to win a Johnny here, which means that I prefer to sequence out the Lotus Cobra. I'm actually looking for more lands at this point. Go ahead and get him for a little bit of damage off the Cobra. I attempt to slam the Thalia here. They do not counter the Thalia, but I believe they burn her out. Yeah, they, they abrupt decay her. Drawing to a Caracas, get some free mana off of this, which is kind of nice because I can two spell now. What I actually have to do instead is uh, use it for black mana because I don't have uh, dedicated black mana at the moment. It's possible I wanted to just cast out a Grim Flayer plus the Ajani, but they had Spell Pierce regardless. I don't know if they have more counter magic, but I'm still going to be able to attack with the onboard threats I've got. Uh, but what I could have done is play the Grim Flayer out first, see if they countered it, and then cast a Johnny or cast a Johnny and then Grim Flayer. Uh, but I have to just go for the high high uh, upside play, which is just slamming the uh, the Mind Twist. I get remanded here. Um, I am able to get a Elves of Deep Shadow down, which is actually not irrelevant because it does fix for black, which allows me to open up Abrupt Decay plus uh, Grim Flare. Cast out the Ajani here. I believe they have a counter spell for Ajani. I cast out the Grim Flare as a 4-4 uh, after Ajani gets countered. And Grim Flare is a 4-4 is going to be a little tougher to remove. I'm kind of hoping not to see a, a Sweeper here, but even if they sweep, I still have good follow-ups with uh, Greens of the Zenith. Um, I have to go for Collective Brutality here. I believe this... Something eats in a braid. I think it's one of my elves. Yeah, they, they just target my Land of War elves. They have a land in hand, so now what I have to do is just cast out Green Sun Zenith for three. Um, honestly, like, if... When I started looking through my deck, I forgot I added Gaddock Teague. And I was like, yeah, I probably should have just done it for two. I ended up getting Gaddock Teague as opposed to, like, a higher um, upside three drop. Because I figure Gaddock Teague um, just ensures they can't mize me and, like, and draw, like, a, a Damnation um, or consume the Meek or something like that. Uh, they see the draw step for the turn and just pack it in. They're very dead on the next turn. And that's actually the other reason I did it. I didn't get like a you know a kitchen fix or something like that. I just got Gaddix. I figured it stopped a lot more. Um, and the fact that I can activate the Stirring Wildwood on the following turn just to attack in for lethal with what I already have is just kind of put me over on Gaddix. But I do think that I probably should have thought through the line a little bit more before I opened my deck up and left Caracas open as opposed to tapping all of my mana for Greens and Zenith so that I could have protected the Gaddix Teague um, on their turn. Um, anyways, guys. Quick pause, we'll be back for game number two against what appears to be, like, I don't know, uh, five-color control. I don't know exactly. Um, let's look at it again. Yeah, like, five-color control. Kind of what it looks like. Anyways, guys, quick pause, we'll be back momentarily. Alrighty, guys, back. Um, and, yeah, hand's acceptable. I mean, it's got a recursive threat. It's got hand attack. It's got... It can basically cast all of its spells pretty easily. Uh, see, a preordain here. I'm probably just going to go scrub land Inquisition of Kozlik on turn one. Um, which is what we do, and quick pause to what we discuss their hand. So I go ahead and I believe just get Ancestral Vision out of their hand and leave them with two red cards they can currently not cast in a Counter Squall, which only counters one of the cards in my hand. So I'm pretty happy with, with, with what their hand looks like. I feel pretty good with the hand that I've got. Um, I do go ahead and play out a fetch land here, I believe. Get just uh, Savannah. This is going to limit me on my ability to cast red spells, i.e. Falcorath Aristocrat. But I feel like, you know, the Grim Flayer is going to set me up well enough here. They do go ahead and cast out a Vendillion Click. I actually, because I know they have a Counter Squall, I just go ahead and Zealous Persecution right now. Um, it's going to mean I get a little more damage in this turn, and it's also going to mean that I get to filter my top deck and hopefully find a red source to cast the Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. I actually find all, like, nonsense. I just, I've been every single one of those cards, so I'm looking pretty specifically for a red mana source. And they just go ahead and pack it in. They don't have a red mana source, evidently. They have a counter squall. I have a 4-4 threat on the board after discarding those cards, which creature card was the last relevant card that I needed to make it a 4-4. And they just figure they're dead. They're going to be down to 10. If I hit a red source on the next turn, I can probably not kill them outright, but get them low enough that they're within striking range. Um, if I don't, then I'm probably playing an Aven Mind Sensor out on their EOT to force them to counter and then hope to you know draw on the following turn into a red source. So... 
pretty advantage position against five color control here, and they just go ahead and pack it in. All right, guys, quick pause, and I'll be back uh, momentarily for more gameplay with the deck. All right, guys, playing Mox Pegasus again here. Uh, this hand is great. It's got a turn one d uh, Dark Confidant. Um, you know, it could also cast uh, the Discard spell, the Collective Brutality, plus Grim Flare. Um, it is lacking the ability to cast its three drop and also its Gattactique, but I think it's fine. They go ahead and uh, burn off a Brainstorm immediately, possibly looking for like a Force of Alert Daze because maybe they don't have a good answer to this card uh, immediately. I'm able to draw to another land. Unfortunately, it's not a land that comes to play on tap, so I'm not able to get a three drop down now, but I get Grim Flare down. They cast on a Brea, the Ethereum Sculptor, I want to say is her name. She's a very powerful card. Um... I just go ahead and get rid of uh, her right now. I look at their hand first to make sure I'm not going to get, like, mental misstep or something like that. Their hand's not that great. It has one Baleful Strix. I go ahead and attack in, uh, try to pump this thing to a 4-4, four -four, and I manage to get there with it. Grimflare is a card that, like, really vacillates for value in me. Like, against red decks, it's not that great, but, um, you know, when you're against control and you get to get it to a 4-4 four -four early, it's really powerful. We get the Tireless Tracker down here and just start making, getting value off of it. I go ahead and attack with the, uh, the, uh, Grim Flayer. I feel like it's done its job at this point, um, and I have enough of a card engine on, in play that if they don't rip exactly this turn, like, a business spell, like, they're probably just gonna die. Uh, I believe I end up leaving, like, an Ajani Planeswalker on top of my deck, plus I have a Gaddic T to kind of, like, lock them up, and I have Courser for additional value. Courser plus Tireless Tracker is just dumb. Um, and we've got Bob going, so, like, there's a lock going against him here, and they just go ahead and pack it in. Um, I assume they're, what they're playing is kind of like, um, uh, Dark Jess guy, uh, big mana control deck. Um, you know, especially when I see cards like uh, Brea, who's very powerful in that kind of archetype. Um, which at one point was kind of like a command. It was a one v one commander deck with with Brea. Um, I'm assuming they probably altered the deck to have much higher threat density than the the Brea list tended to have. It was more of a quintessential control deck. Um, you know, but not a bad strategy. I don't see Brea all that often, but she is definitely a, a very powerful card. If you can cast her, I think she's definitely worth including. Uh, but cool to get to see her. So anyways, guys, quick pause. We'll be back for the next game in this match set. Alrighty, guys, we're back. Um, yeah, hand's fine. I mean, it's got to turn... Well, the hand has some liabilities. It wants double black, realistically. But it draws into a Doran, of course, and we'll be able to put a Doran down on turn two if we don't get countered. Uh, but it's got pretty solid follow-up in the form of uh, Siege Rhino, you know, if we draw another land, which we do here. Get a little lucky. Um, also, you know, it's got a Tasker, so if, like, everything goes to hell and, like, everything gets countered, then we can just play a Tasker around after doing all of it and probably have, um, possibly activation mana, but definitely, like, a, possibly, a, you know, an abrupt care or something like that. Uh, draw into Colgan's Command, which is not bad. They don't have a counter for this, evidently, um, after mulliganing, I think, to six. Um... You know, and Siege Rider just spells the enemy. This is a, f a five hit this turn, uh, down to uh, down to fourteen with a fetch on board, which means they're at a virtual thirteen plus uh, a ten hit on the following turn, putting them down to three, which is striking range for Lightning Bolt. Um, so very very quick start out of us, you know, and they just didn't have the disruption to kind of slow down our start, and we just run them over with the, the mock start. Um, so that's you know that's one of the things that can happen uh, is the control players if you mulligan uh, you know too heavily you can just be too low on resources to really get uh, stay in or get back in the game um, and that's what you kind of see here so uh, sorry to, sorry to give a, a bad game to you mox but uh, yeah you know it's you know that's kind of one of the things this deck does is um, you know if if you don't have a good interactive start on control it just charges in and runs them over uh, that's kind of the plan all right guys quick pause we'll be back momentarily for more gameplay. All right, guys, back. Um, yeah, this hand is um, acceptable. Um, it's got a fetch plus a de death right shaman. Uh, one downside is I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna be off black mana uh, with this hand. Cause I'm gonna have to fetch Tiger. Uh, correction, no, I fetch Badlands here. That's right. So I get Forceful here, and I'm like, wow, that's aggressive. Um, and they've pitched a time walk to it or time twister to it. So I think in my head I'm probably playing against High Tide, but I don't. So. I did talk to MTG Shark, and MTG Shark, I'm sorry if I sounded, like, nasty about it. I was like, I really didn't agree with this line of play. Um, they took here, um, so they burned the Time Pusher off. It's more than likely they have High Tide in hand now, uh, but they're down to three cards. So they're pretty low on resources. I end up kind of just, like, failing to find lands here. They Frantic Search for low value, um, you know, because they they're not getting extra man off from High Tide. Um, they put out an Aether Flux Reservoir, which is a pretty powerful card, but I'm pretty sure the last card in their hand is like a, a, a High Tide here. I could be wrong on that, though. They could have Demonic Tutor for something else. <clears throat> it could have actually specifically been the, the Reservoir. I guess to dig through time, which is a pretty powerful draw. 
Play a fetch land out, which I assume they found off of that. I kind of continue to dead draw here. I just don't hit mana. Um, they pass it back. Find Inquisition. Go ahead and look at their hand. They cast out High Tide immediately. I look at their hand here, and it is a turnabout. So I'm pretty sure off of the Demonic Tutor they did draw into the High Tide, or they found the High Tide. They could have also found Reservoir. I don't know. They might as well. Uh, they, they draw into uh, uh, the Young Boss Will, which may have been the best possible draw they could have had there. Um, outside of something like, maybe Time Spiral will be better, but no, nah, Yogg Will is pretty good here. Uh, with DT and High Tide and Frantic Search in the yard, like, they're pretty... I just go ahead and pack it in here. Um, you know, we had kind of a, a pretty high variance poor draw in regards to mana, and just didn't really play a game of Magic. Um, you know, and they, they had a pretty solid draw in this game, which is not a bad thing. I mean, it's good. It's good to have good top decks. Um, but I think deconstructing this game, like the Force of Will play, I don't think was the best. I think what their concern was is that Deathrite Shaman would get played and that would like exile cards of their graveyard and it would weaken like their Yogmoth's will plan. Um that's possibly true, but realistically like I'm not gonna take that much time doing that. I'm probably just gonna use Deathrite Shaman for mana to progress my own game plan of casting spells and, and just beating them down quickly. But either way, you know, we end up losing this one, you know, uh I, I think mostly to a little bit of variance. Um, you know, we just we had bad draws. We just drew into uh, no landage. Uh, but that's the thing that can happen, right? It's the thing that can happen in games of Magic, and you just go on to game two when that happens. So anyways, guys, quick pause. We lose this one pretty pretty handily to, against High Tide, and go into game two. All right, guys, back. Um, yeah, this hand's great. Um, well, this hand's interesting, right? Like, it, it has turn one interaction against a combo deck, which is, generally speaking, pretty good. Um, their hand is great. Uh, so, again, quick pause. We'll go into their hand. Their hand is Spell Snare, which, you know, means they can get any two drop that I may have to play. They've got Time Twister, Dizzy Spell, High Tide, and Dark Petition. Dark Petition is a castable right now, so really what their hand needs to work really well is just lands. They just need to draw lands. Otherwise, this hand is stacked. It's very, very good. Um, and Twister plus High Tide is no joke. Dizzy Spell... I don't know what it's going to find once you have High Tide in hand. Possibly like a Ponder uh, or uh, Personal Tutor. Um... You know, I, I would think... Or, or Brainstorm, even. Uh, so we draw very well and draw into Renegade Rallyer. Renegade Rallyer is a 6-3. It's really powerful in this deck. It's going to be able to, to ramp us up a little bit here. Um, we know they have a Spell Snare in hand, so they're not... They don't likely have a counter for the Renegade Rallyer they drew in the last turn, unless they drew into like a Daze or something like that. Um, they do find their Black Mana, which is good. Find a High Tide here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and jam Saskia and put them to 8 and say, hey, win next turn. Um... That's what Saskia does. That's why like, I often will call her like the 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 mid range scape shift, <laughs> um, because that's she just ends the game. Like it's just like all right, nope, I'm done. Like because realistically, what they have to do here is like play out the other island. They don't have the high tide. I guess yeah, they don't even have high tide. I don't know if they can win here. I mean, they have to like twist her into like the stone nuts. I don't even know how you could untap your lance at that point though. Yeah, no, there's not draws probably in the game of Magic to, to get out of this. So anyways, you know, they, they do not get out of it. They just die to it. So anyways, we go on to game number three. All right, guys, welcome back. Game number three against High Tide. Hands good. It's got a voice of resurgence to uh, put down some early interaction. Found a mana dork on turn one. All coming together pretty nice. It's going to allow us to play out a turn three door, and if, especially if they tap down for something. They play on a search for his content, which I'm fine with. Um, it's possible I should have just fetched here to thin my deck a little bit. I know that sounds like really marginal, but this deck, you know, even when playing uh, 32 lands, really doesn't want to draw more lands than this, so... You know, every little bit helps. Uh, this is a pretty nice turn, though. I get to play out the Voice for Resurgence. They definitely do not have counter magic. Um, and I'm able to leave up the Assassin's Trophy in case I need to use it for some shenanigans on their turn. They go ahead and Personal Tutor. Personal Tutor cannot directly find um, High Tide, so they find Merchant Scroll, which is pretty powerful. What I have to do here is play out a Bob. They don't do anything about that. Then I opt to try to cast uh, Assassin's Trophy on uh, their black mana source. They actually mana leak this, and it makes sense because they wouldn't be able to find a land drop if they really want to draw into that Merchant Scroll. But it also gives me a massive clock because they're forced to counter it on my turn. Now, it's possible I should have done that before, Bob. Um, I start drawing a bazillion cards a turn. I... Yeah, I figure that they're on like a turnabout or a cryptic command here because they haven't countered any of my stuff. Um, or they haven't countered my rel like they haven't countered like a lot of my early progression. 
Um, so I don't play the Elspeth out first just to pump one of my things. I just play Elspeth out afterwards to play on a soldier or to make a soldier token. Part of the reason I do that is because one of the ways they could possibly get out of this is through a Rising Tides or high, not, I always forget the card's name. It's a, a, a four drop blue three and it returns um, all creatures with power less than or equal to the number of islands you have, which at this point in the game would return everything I have. Um, Excepting the two elemental tokens, which are seven sevens, but they would become two twos at that point. But that's still going to be enough to kill them because I can just you know pump them with Elspeth or just replay enough creatures to make them big enough to to win the game. So opponent goes in, and packs it in, quick clock, complemented with some some minor disruption. It's just enough to get them here. Um, and on to the next match in this uh, let's play with uh, four color blood. All right, guys, we are back. And yeah, hand is pretty great. You know, it's got, um... We're playing against BMCG here. I don't know what he's playing yet. Uh, play on a Deathrite Shaman on turn one. You know, make it burned off. That's fine. I uh, assume when I see a Mountain and a Volk, then I'm either playing against, uh... Blue Red Moon, or I'm playing against, uh... Jeskai. Get out the Caselli Pride Mage. Seems fine. Um, I probably actually should have... Yeah, I probably should have done that on, on main one if I was in a wasteland there. I play out the scrappy scrap heap scrounger here. Um, I am relying on hitting lands here. I unfortunately do not. I go ahead and swords to plowshares this. I believe they counter it. Yeah, they sink a paint my swords to plowshares, which is fine. I go ahead and play out burbs out and get in there with both cards. Um, I figure if I trade off the Casali Pride Mage now, now that I know they're on chess guy, I figure they're not a back to basic stack, so the utility of uh, Casali Pride Mage probably goes down a little bit. And I figure if I trade it off now, that means that when my Scrap Heap dies later, I can get my Scrap Heap back. To play a set of Finks here, I'm a little mana choked right now. Uh, they cast a Remand on my Finks. Say, okay. Play out of Plains. Uh, get a Mentor down, and now it's kind of the beginning of the end. I'm like, okay. They have a Treasure Cruise, which is rough. Like, them getting a bunch of cards back is pretty tough, because we're trying to kind of play an incremental game plan. They drew a Force of Will off TC, uh, which is real bad for me. I'm just like, well, if this resolve, I feel like if the Colgan's Command resolves there, I'm probably able to win the game. I go ahead and trade the Scrappy Boy. He can't block regardless, and I can get him back with the Casali Pride Mage that I traded off earlier. I get hit for three here. Cast out a... Um, Inquisition of Kozlak, and see that they're basically on air balls with the remainder of their hand. They have um, a Lodge Knot that I got, and a land. Unfortunately, oh, and Dig Through Time. So they cast Dig Through Time here, and I'm like, oh, goodness. Um, luckily, unless they draw into the Pact of Negation, um, or Days, this Knight is going to resolve. I don't know how relevant the Knight's going to be. I pretty much feel like the game's over. One of the cards they found off Dig Through Time was uh, Ancestral Recall. So, you know, one of the things, one of the liabilities you run into against Jeskai is they see a lot of cards, right? And when they have nine points, you know, in the, the top 30 of their deck, or top, you know, 30 to 40 of their deck, and they get to see that many, um, you're in a rough spot. It's turn eight, man, they've seen nine points. That's, that's going to be tough for my deck to beat. Um, they cast a World Leader Helix, I believe, targeting the Knight, and they're not going to get through for the lethal this turn, but pretty close. Um, actually, maybe they are. This is 5, 4, 3. Yeah, 5, oh, yeah, 5, 4, 3. No, 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 this has already been pumped, so this is going to be 3 plus 5. I'm not quite dead this turn. If they can cast one more spell, I think I'm dead this turn. Uh, but anyways, I'm not going to come back from this. Like, Monastery Mentor is pretty tough to come back from. It's pretty tough to come back from in Vintage. Um, you know, and, and a more fair, uh, you know, more incremental deck like my own, I'm not going to come back from that. Uh, but what it really came down to is, you know, like, they, they saw the points they needed to see. Um, and it was also a very clutch force of will. I, I think we could have beaten the card draw with without the onboard advantage. But once they get card draw plus onboard advantage you're probably not going to deal with it. So, liability of the deck, right? One of the liabilities you can run into uh, with this deck against other fair decks like Jeskai Midrange. Quick pause, guys. We'll be back for game number two in this match. Alrighty, guys. We are back. Hand looks great. Going to turn one Bob. Probably going to get Lightning Bolted or Plowed or Path or something like that. But if it doesn't and I get a card off of it, I feel great about this hand. Yeah, they have it. They have a Source of Plowshares. Beautiful old version of it, too. Um, I cast out two Mana Dorks and a land. Um, they cast out a Lightning Strike, getting rid of the Death Rite Shaman. I draw to an Arc Trail. Not really a great hand at this point. Like, it was really banking on the Bob to kind of make it better. I knew it was a liability of losing Bob. I just go ahead and vindicate one of their lands, try to bide some time here. Attempt to cast out a good 4-drop that I drew off the top of my deck. Like I said, we do rely on the top of our deck quite a bit. They cast out a Syncopate again, uh, getting my uh, Huntmaster of the Fells. And I'm still kind of just sitting here, like, hoping to draw well. 
And like I said, now now this point in these in this recorded these recorded matchups, the deck's in the completed form that I, I showed it to you earlier. So it's not running 34 lands at this point. It's down to 32. So it should top deck pretty well. They have a miscount. That's fine. Like, you know, I figure I'm going to be trading off with them for a while. Now, I don't mind trading off with blue decks on counter spells because it's more than likely they're going to draw more lands than I will. And I'll draw more threats, right? So it's the last one or the first one that kills him. And in this case, you know, it's the Palace Jailer that pretty much kills him. It's only a 2-2. I get punished pretty hard here if they do have, like, a flash threat, but they evidently don't. They just have some burn. I go ahead and slam in there with the Jailer. Not really doing a ton of damage, but I'm seeing a ton of cards. Have an uncounterable here uh, in the form of Luxodon Smiter. I'm able to get a Path to Exile out of their hand, get another land for my troubles. Cast out a Tidal of Sculler, which eats a memory lapse. I go ahead and play my land out. Pop the... Uh, the Horizon Canopy, draw back into Title of Sculler, take a look at their hand, or try to take a look at their hand. And now they are on Bupkiss. They have nothing left. So they Crypto Command. Well, they have a card they got off Crypto Command. But I pretty much burned through a lot of good cards in their hand. And I've run into a Doran at this point, so I'm going to cast out Doran, of course. Uh, play on a tapped land, uh, draw to Finx. You know, the Monarchy just does what it does against blue decks here. And basically, I drew my Ancestral Recall this time around, which is IE Palace Jailer. Um, down to one. Um, I try to cast on the Finks here to see if I can get a counter spell out of their hands. Unfortunately, I guessed wrong here. They do have a... I should have sequenced this differently. I mean, it's, it's six of one, half dozen the other. Like, they're pretty dead regardless, but if I had uh, sequenced the Arc Trail first, I would have played around Mana Leak, but if I was playing around just any counter spell, like, I, I felt like it, it was better to play Finks first. Either way, you know, we give them an extra turn, but they see their draw step, and they're just like, nope, I'm dead. And eh, it's going to be pretty hard to come back to this. Like, even Inferno Titan's not enough here. Like, Inferno Titan would get rid of, like, you know, one of these two things, and then I would just Zealous Persecution and just kill them next turn. Um, or Liliana, Aether, Inferno Titan, plus Zealous Persecution, plus Abrupt Decay. Like, just too many cards. So, anyways, guys, quick pause. We'll be back for game number three in this match set against BMCG on Jeskai uh, Control. All right, guys, we're back. Um, this is a really great matchup. Like, I actually kind of like this matchup. I have to mulligan down here, but I'm on the draw, which means that it's a little bit more favorable to, to mulligan. Um, or my mulligans are a little less impactful. Um, I makes I get to have a card off of it. They have some slow lands. Um, I'm able to get a dork down on turn one, which is pretty great. Um, I opt to go for a green sun zenith this turn into a Voice of Resurgence, which is going to stymie a lot of their counter magic. They play on a Search for Iskanta. Of course, I Mize like a Miser and draw into uh, Night of Autumn, which gives me a token off of the uh, Voice of Resurgence uh, because they Force of Will it, try to keep their Search for Iskanta around. I don't think Search tends to be as relevant in these style of matchups, just due to the fact that you don't really have time for it. They do have a Path to Exile here. I'm able to get a Forest out of my deck. Um, I do go ahead and play out a Huntmaster of the Fells. Play out my other land untapped. Uh, go ahead and two spell this turn. Oh, no, I don't. I don't have... They don't, there's no lands in the, the graveyard. I just go ahead and dome them with the, the Deathrite Shaman. They draw a land for their turn after binning a land, so they can't cast a spell this turn, which means Huntmaster of the Fell is going to flip, kill their young Pyromancer, uh, become a 4-4, and the game is just, you know, basically over. Uh, I think they mulled the 6 in this one, had a little bit less resources, had to ditch more resources due to Force of Will... Uh, because they wanted to keep their search around and try to get out of the, the, the mulligan that they had gone into. Um, you know, we're able to just get them with, with high card quality here. Um, so anyways, guys, quick pause. We'll be back for the next game in this Let's Play. All right, guys, we're back. Hey, looks acceptable. It's got a 2-drop, 3-drop, 4-drop. It's got some interaction in the form of Dramoka's Command. Play on a tapped uh, Overgrown Tomb on the first turn. Um... Plan is just to get the Putrid Leech down in the next turn. We're a little short on white mana right now, but we should be able to progress pretty well into a course of crew fix, or if we need to, we'll remove a threat with the uh, Dramocus Command. We see an opt. Uh, we're either playing against blue-white control, or we're playing against, like, maybe Jeskai again. Possibly Esper. Go ahead and slam in there. Pump the Leech. Cool. I guess go ahead and uh, Thoughtseize here. They Path to Exile me, which is not a bad deal because it means that I'm going to have an easier time casting my spells. They have a very landed hand, so their hand is all lands and one disallow. I had to get the disallow, and I'm like, oh, that's cool with me. Um, <clears throat> kind of a weird spot in the game, so I'm not, I'm not going to play around Counter Magic here. Unfortunately, I don't see a land on top. I see a virtual land in the form of Mox Emerald. So I'm going to play that one off the top this turn with Core Serve Crew Fix. Draw to the Mox, see an Arc Trail. This hand is kind of awkward due to the fact that it doesn't have any good shuffle effects to kind of, you know, get some more value out of Courser. And it can't play its Bomb card. Um, it just has a lot of interaction. I'm not really interested in casting Winter War about yet. I kind of want to get them to, like, counter some stuff before I do that. 
So they just keep beating down with Courser, which is not a bad plan. I mean, they're eventually going to have to deal with the Courser. Go ahead and play Badlands out here and just keep on slamming. Just keep on chipping away, as it were. <clears throat> I do play Winter Orb out this turn because I figure if they're going to, like, slam something, I don't know what, then maybe it could be relevant. Plus, I don't really need all this mana, so I have to start tapping my mana. I'm not too upset about it. I see a Luxodon Smiter coming up, which is going to be a pretty strong one, I think, to play. I do play the Elves out here just to up the clock a little bit. They play on a Future Sight, which I am more than comfortable with. I plus on my uh, Courser, force them to sack the Future Sight, and now they're down five lands, essentially. They basically, you know, blew up five of their own lands, which to me is fine. I attack in there for four. I believe they have an answer this turn. No, they just go to two. Um, I do go ahead and arc trail them and just win the game. So, you know, they kept a little bit riskier of a hand with a lot more lands. I don't think it was wrong. I just think it was a hand that is probably a little bit too risky against aggressive decks like my own. I don't have a spectacular draw. My mana doesn't really progress exceedingly well to get a bomb threat down. I just don't draw many more bombs. I draw kind of just more interaction and more mana. Uh, but, you know, just with the draws lined up, we're able to just kind of trick them out in this game. So we pause, guys. I'll be back momentarily for the next game in this match set. All right, guys, we are back. The hand looks fine. You know, it's got some liabilities as far as color fixing, but it does have two relevant threats that it can play. You know, um, it's going to have a Smiter now at some point. It's also got Lingering Souls, which is castable off these lands as long as I draw one more land. But it's hoping to draw black and red mana. I do draw into a tapped land here, which I actually opt to play out uh, this turn against blue-white, especially on the play. They're going to have mana up for counter magic. So I opt just to, you know, throw throw out, you know, the... the, the um, I have to go with a less uh, efficient line to get more value. I do play out a Luxodon Smiter here. <clears throat> they have an end-step Nimble Obstructionist, which I'm fine with. Black Mana would be really nice now because I've drawn Mind Twist, which is a pretty powerful card against them. They Memory Lapse my um, Leering Souls, which is actually probably one of the better counter spells they could have used against it because I'd actually rather that card be in the graveyard. I, I don't mind them countering it, but I don't really want it to be on top of my deck because I'm actually looking to draw mana here. I do go for an attack on the Jace Architect of Thought. They do block, yep, with Nimble Obstructionist. <clears throat> I replay the Souls here. It's, Souls is a really bad card against Jace Architect of Thought, though. Um, I just play it because it's one of the few things I could play. They do Logic Not My Fleece Main Lion, which is okay. Mana's kind of not progressing very well this game, though. They do have a Cast Out, so they end up getting my 4-4, which kind of stinks, but eh. They could get worse things. <clears throat> now if I can hit a black mana, I can cast this Butcher of the Horde and just knock the uh, the Jace out. But they play a Bane Slayer Angel. Now I'm just hoping to hit white mana. Um, I think it may have been a misplay on my part to actually sack the Horizon Canopy. I was really looking for mana there, but I probably should have just saved it because I needed that extra white mana uh, to cast out the uh, Palace Chiller. I do attempt to Mind Twist them for two. They have a Spell Pierce. Cool. So I hang out. Cards like Bane Slayer Angel can actually be a decent problem for this deck. This deck does have a lot of removal in it, but, you know, if they can get ahead and get an untapped with the Bane Slayer Angel, it's pretty tough. They end up, I believe, countering this or doing something horrible to it. No, they just draw. They just draw. I get Marchesa down, and I think I attack the Jace Architect of Thought for two. I'm still kind of hoping to hit my white mana fix. Um, I, I have a couple turns because of the Spirit Tokens to, like, just stay alive. They go ahead and Fractured Identity my Marchessa. Uh, when she comes back into play as a token, they get the Monarchy, and I'm just like, ah, I'm good. I'm good. You got me. Um, so, Mana kind of failed to progress here, and, you know, because the Mana failed to progress, that was a risk of the hand, too. We did keep, you know, one basic land, which we, you generally only want your basic in your deck just to... The basics in the deck to play around Assassin's Trophy and Path to Exile, it's basically to have a basic to find. You generally don't want it in your openers. You're relying on your non-basics to produce your initial mana to get your dorks in play. Uh, but when your mana kind of fails to progress and you keep a riskier hand like the one we kept that had uh, worse mana progression, um, you kind of run into draws like this where you just don't progress um, effectively. And against control, that's kind of a... That's a, you know, you basically just lose. Um, that's what I was saying. Like, sometimes I will keep hands that look like garbage piles because they have just, like, a bunch of, like, multi... Like, a bunch of different lands in them. But the deck draws out generally pretty well. It just really needs to progress its mana in the in the early uh, to mid-game to, to do so. So, anyways, guys, quick pause, and we'll be back momentarily for the next game of this match set. 
All right, guys, we're back. Um, this is a concluding game in the match against Esper. Oh, I'm sorry, Blue White. Uh, so fetch land into birds. Uh, plan is to play a tireless tracker out and get value off tireless tracker on turn two. Tireless tracker down. Ancestral recall happens. See, I don't really care about ancestral recall because they're probably going to be discarding here. And secondly, like I have a draw engine and a bunch of threats online, so like they, there's a lot to answer here. Uh, this is kind of the power of this deck. Is like when it's on the play and it has to draw like this, like it's tough for a blue deck to come back from behind. They ditch a Bane Slayer and a Restoration Angel. Probably fair. They're probably looking for mana just to progress their own game plan. I get to draw a bunch of cards here. I basically uh, turn my card into a Fire Elemental. <laughs> what I like to call it. Draw another Fetch Land, which is going to be good in another turn cycle. Play out the Elves of Deep Shadow because this hand's going to be mana hungry because it does have a Tireless Tracker and it wants to draw those cards and also play threats. So having more Dorks down I think is relevant here. They play out a Port Town. I go ahead and fetch. They likely have counter magic at this point, so I don't believe I slam Elspeth right away. I play a Fleece Man. I'll try to clear any counter magic out of their hand. Fire up the Stirring Wildwood. Uh, draw a card with a clue. Get exceedingly lucky, and I believe find Wasteland here. Uh, so EOT, or not EOT, second main. I'm going to play out Wasteland. Blow up their Port Town so they can't Wrath me. No, I guess I already played a land that turn. So I may have misplayed that. Even if they had Wrath, I still had Stirring Wildwood to kind of, you know, close the game out, plus uh, Colgan's command to do the last two. Uh, so, yeah, just kind of, you know, do what this deck does and smash their eyelids shut really fast so Control can't keep pace with it. Um, you know, so yeah, that's that's kind of how the deck functions against, against the, the blue, white, blue, white, red decks. Um, is it tends to just try to attrit them out really fast, even though my opponent had a pretty powerful start with Ancestral Recall. Um, you know, it was more so used for, like, filtration. It was almost like they cast, like, an upgraded Faithless Looting because they had to discard two cards off of it. Um, it's way better than it's just Faithless Looting, but in, in a way, it was kind of like that. Um, but they just don't have... Um, if they don't have a good way to deal with the board really quickly, you know, and even if they did here, like, they're probably still in the Hurt Box because I'll just, you know, untap and play an Elizabeth or a Gideon and probably win with those. Or, you know, if I hit enough mana, you know, just, you know, attack with the Searing Wildwood and, and, and burn them out. Uh, but anyways, you know, pretty tough when it has starts like this. That's kind of the power of the Moxon as well, is like you can see like how they, they, they can just power out some pretty busted starts that the slower control decks really just can't come back from. Um, anyways, guys, quick pause. We'll be back for, I believe, the concluding game in this Let's Play with Four Color Blood. Alright, guys, we're back for a game against Sneaky here. Sneaky tends to play blue decks, and I like playing against blue decks this deck. This hand's fine. Um, it may not look that good, but like it has a ton of lands, but it has a great two. Uh, but it has a, uh, basically a, a free roll land. Now it has removal. And it has a Saskia. Um I'm playing against blue, which this hand's pretty good against a blue deck. And the mana's going to progress, right? So, like, I tend to like to keep hands that look shadier like this than, than hands that um that just have, like, you know, a bunch of threats. Uh, because this deck's just going to draw good stuff. You know, they hit me. They get probably the two worst cards out of my hand, unfortunately, for them. I take them to Pound Town, put them down to eight here. That's a pretty standard Saskia hit, is 8, uh, when she's cast, you know, on turn 3 or 2. Um, get a fetch land here, path to exile, path to exile or threat. They still have 5 cards in hand, but they're just dead. Like, that's just it. Like, um, yeah, so Saskia again. One card combo, guys. Like, it's a one card combo. Like, it's just, you know, this is, uh, yeah. I mean, they have 5 cards in hand, but they can't do anything about it, right? So, anyways, that concludes game number 1 against this blue deck. This uh, blue-black deck, it appears, or possibly Grixis deck, uh, we'll see in game 2. So, Kabasa will be back momentarily for the next game. Alright, guys, back. Um, yeah, this hand's uh, kind of on the lot, the borderline. This hand, again, like, it has the basic. I hate having the basic in my openers because, like, it's just going to limit a lot of your good top decks. Uh, for instance, like, right here, like, we're going to be able to cast everything with the exception of, like, the Falconrath Aristocrat. And we do have issues getting to Vindicate mana on this hand. So play out the uh, Godless Shrine. I just go ahead and get Grim Flare down. It's possible that I wanted to try to get down the Elves of Deep Shadow and then set up the um, the Anafensa on the next turn. But as you can see, they just have an answer anyways. Uh, they have Kalidus here. I do just go ahead and Vindicate this because Kalidus is a big dude. Like, he's just a problem. I get him to Turret here. Uh, getting probably my best threat. Then they have a Trinum Nemesis. I play out the Tireless Tracker because I figure if they don't have an answer to it and I draw lands, I can kind of get back up on cards here. Uh, believe, unfortunately, you know, they have Dax. They Dax, they filter. Uh, they're just going to sit back and play the blocking game with True Name Nemesis, which is, is pretty tough for this deck to beat. I do go ahead and get a Luxon on Smiter down. Just say go. No good attacks here. And then I have two Mana Dorks in hand. Dax probably going to be able to pull them ahead, given the time that True Name Nemesis gives them here. Drawing a Renegade Rallyer. I just play out uh, this one Dork so that 
possibly if I draw like an Elsbeth, I can attack over the top and like just kill Dak in one hit with an Elsbeth swing on Luxodon Smiter. Uh, I go ahead and attack with both these because I actually don't mind losing the the elves here um, to be able to use Renegade Rallyer. But I'm not going to cast Renegade Rallyer out for no value, especially if like I get Damnation here. Um, I want to have a follow up to that, and I wouldn't be surprised if they Damnation over the top of True Name Nemesis' head. Um, unfortunately, now we're in like a ton of trouble. They have a Jason Mind Sculptor down. Uh, they have a Dak Emblem, which with the burn is going to be able to steal my 4-drop threats. I do go ahead and knock out the Telepath Unbound here. They also have Escanta flipped. Uh, I'll play out Renegade Rallyer uh, for no value, just to put a body on the board. <clears throat> I believe this is the turn we concede. I, I forget what they cast here. They cast Explosion for 1, just draw a card and steal my 3-2. Attack for 7. Um, I don't block here. I draw Collective Brutality, attempt to cast the Collective Brutality to gain some life and kill this thing. They have Counter Squall, put me down to 3, i.e. inside Bolt Range, the uh, deck, or with adjacent Mind Sculptor in play, plus a Search for his Kanta and an Overwhelming Board Presence. Um, that includes True Nemesis that's unblockable, so I'm dead on the next turn. Um, but pretty cool game, you know? Like We got to kind of see, one, that their Grixis, their mana wasn't working last time. Um, we kind of got to see the power of their deck, um, which is, you know, that once they can get, you know... Um, you know, uh, some overwhelming card engines online, uh, plus, you know, like, some some good blockers like True Nemesis, you know, they can just kind of stymie us. Uh, what we're really looking for here is some of our flying threats um, and or threats or threats like Elspeth that allow us to fly over top <coughs> to get rid of their value engines or at least put them under tempo. I just tapped that card. That's kind of funny. I didn't know you could tap cards in replays. Huh. Interesting. Anyways, guys, that that aside, I guess you can tap cards in, 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 in replays. That's bizarre. Um... You know, either that or you just, you know you do enough damage to them that like it, it renders the True Name Nemesis moot. The one funny thing about True Name Nemesis is, well, it um it does abate a lot of races. Once you get the ability to race it on board, it has a hard time actually racing back. Is kind of what I found. So like for instance, if I draw like a Vampire Aristocrat, well, I guess I can't draw because it's my graveyard. But if I played a Vampire Aristocrat and it resolved here, and I just swung in and just smashed him for four damage, like at some point they're going to be obliged to start attacking me. Uh, with True Nemesis, and when they do that, it's very hard for them to actually, res uh, you know, do that responsibly, because then I just swing back for so much more, because so I can unlock my uh, Stirring Wildwood, I can attack with some number of the 1-1s here if I want to, plus the 4-1 flyer. You know, so it, what I mean, I guess, by that is, is True Nemesis does hold off the race, it basically, like, you know, puts suspend on racing, but once the race starts, you know, it's very hard for True Nemesis to sit back, because, you know, if you have one thing that can swing, you know, unblocked by it, Generally speaking, it has to swing back just so that, you know, because they, they, they don't have forever to actually just sit back on it. And then it becomes a lot harder for them to even do that because you just swing back for more damage. Um, so, you know, oftentimes how I tend to try to play around True Name Nemesis is, one, I have a couple of silver bullets that, like, are good cards regardless, but are good against True Nemesis to include Zealous Persecution and Liliana the Veil. But the other half to it is, is, like, I'll just try to outrace it with an evasive creature. Um, and once, you know, they get to a point where, you know, they realize that they can't just sit back on it forever, they'll start swinging with it, and then when they start swinging with it, you just pound them even harder, and it really it's kind of a, a catch-22. It's a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario, and that's one of the ways that I play around it. But in this game, it was kind of the defining card of how this game played out, because we did have a lot of relevant, we did have a few relevant threats, they just were blanked by this card, pretty much independently. And that's the power of it, that's why it's now pointed, is because it's kind of a free roll in a lot of blue decks, but it's also very, very powerful, and, um, you know, it gets, like, mid-range or aggressive strategies. It's just a wall, you know, that eats things. So, anyways, guys, we'll pause. We'll be back for the next game in this match set. All right, guys, we're back. Um, yeah, hand's great. Um, it's got some mana disruption. It's got a death rate Shaman. Um, I could have fetched there to thin, but, like, I think, honestly, I want to save the fetch uh, just to see a little more and also not let them know that I can use this death rate Shaman on turn two. I do go ahead and use it here. Because I have Wasteland, I actually don't opt to uh, find red mana with it. They cast a Ponder here. I am probably going to just Thought Seize them here. I do go ahead and take the damage, uh, make red mana off of their land, play out the Ajani, tap down their blue-red land, uh, swing in for two, get them down to 17. And now they're in some troubles, because Ajani is a big deal against Control. Uh, I do go ahead and... Uh, they get my Wasteland and my Cool against Command with their Hymn to Turek. Which is pretty savage, but I'm able to play it on a follow-on threat, even though now I'm hellbent. But they're on two mana sources that are homogenous mana sources in a three-colored deck. Um, I did get the opportunity to see their hand, so quick pause while we talk to their hand. So a little bit happened here. So their hand consists of a Spells Pierce, which I don't I can play around for pretty much ever. I don't have a ton of like spells that care about it at this point in the game. Um, they have Engineer Explosives, which they opt to use to kill the Deathrite Shaman. I guess they're afraid of mana fixing, or they think... I don't know. I don't know why they killed the Deathrite Shaman there. 
I may have just got the spirits. I don't know. Because Deathrite Shaman to do damage actually just require me to use mana. Um, it requires resources in the yard. Maybe they drew into like a dig through time or something like that. And they want to set that up or try to set it up. Anyways, a Johnny is just upticking here, and this is like so. It's funny because I do think a Johnny is like one of the weakest four drops in the deck. Um, he is the weakest planeswalker for sure. But the reason, and I kind of talked through like the, the the templating of this deck. This deck is intended to be really good against aggro decks and really good against control decks, which makes it a really optimized switch deck. It's very capable of changing how it wants to play in varied matchups. Why it's good against uh, aggro is because it's basically a healing salve plus. A lightning helix. It's like double healing salve plus lightning bolt. Is kind of how I treat it in the aggro matches, which means you can race the living heck out of them. Um, you know, or they just don't respect it. You can tap a land down or whatever. Whatever. I mean, sometimes you tap a land down against aggro because they just don't have anything going on. But you know, generally you're using it like like I just explained. Like it's control. If you can land this thing, like it just stone rains them. You know, every single turn it cuts them off their most relevant mana source. Um, and eventually it's a Geddon. So one of the things you see my opponent did in this game is like they stopped playing lands out, which I think it's it's kind of weird. But like I don't think you can stop playing lands out because if you do stop playing lands out, then I'm just going to uptick beyond seven and I'm going to have a Johnny after you know he's blown up all the lands. Uh, that's kind of how you see this game play out. So I, I draw into a Lotus Cobra here. I actually don't opt to play the Cobra out at this point. I kind of want them to answer my threats and then I'll play another one out. I don't want to get many for one tier. I think that's how I lose this game. I think right now it's very hard for me to lose this game, but I think the way I do lose it is by overcommitting. Um, and they draw like a Toxic Deluge or something like that, and like then I'm just stuck on a Johnny, and they cast a Burn Spell with a Johnny, and a Johnny goes down below, you know, seven or eight, and I'm not able to ultimate them, and then they play a threat. And that's that's how I lose. I you know, or I draw like a bunch of lands in a row, and that that sequence of plays happens out. As it turns out, you know, that's just enough. Uh, I get a Johnny to seven. This is the turn that I can Armageddon them. I actually probably wouldn't have Armageddon them here. I'd probably just tap down their Volcanic Island, and on the following turn, just ultimate the Johnny. Blow up their four lands. They would have two lands at a minimum that we know about in hand to include Wandering Fumarole and Drown Catacomb. Uh, but, you know, they're on a two-turn clock as well, so it's, it's, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of thing. It's kind of the catch-22 that we want to catch them in here, you know, and just kind of a trip them out. Um, so guys, this is the last game I'm going to showcase with Four Color Blood. Um, I may do another series on it. You know, I'm still kind of refining the list. Let's jump back to the list real quick. Quick pause, I'll jump, jump back to the list and give some closing comments on it, guys. All right, guys, we're back. So, you know, for closing comments and thoughts on this deck, like, I, I do think that I accomplished my goal of having a very strong deck, um, against control, um, you know, I think blue-based or slower combo um, against aggressive decks. Um, you know, we really didn't get to test the combo matchup. I think this is going to be a little better against combo. I guess high tide's kind of a combo, but it's it's a slower combo. Um, it's combo control, really. That's how I treat that deck. Uh, but I do think we have a pretty strong list here of Four Color Blood. Um, I do think it has very strong um, capabilities to play as a switch deck um, against both aggro and control decks. Um I do think what it sacrifices to do that is the uh, value-based mid-range matchups. So when I say value-based mid-range matchups, I mean the pod decks, I mean the blink decks. Uh, those decks are going to be tougher for it to beat. Uh, but I think those decks also assume a, a lot higher risk against like the big blue decks um, you know, and the combo decks than this deck does. Um, so this is kind of a hybrid build between like what you see now is like four-color Boston or like four- or five-color aggro decks. Uh, they play a, a crap ton of one drops just to smash combos eyelids shut, and the more value oriented, you know, mid range decks. It's kind of a hybrid between the two that I think has a really strong switch potential, which I think scales well with pilot experience um, and being capable of maximizing the utility of your cards in a wider range of archetypes. Um, now that said, you know, this deck still has some nut draws. It still has the mox, and it can still smash their eyelids shut with Saskia or you name the card, the four drop. Um, it can smash their eyelids shut by turn three or turn four. Um, it does have turn three potential. It does not have two, turn two potential, but it does have turn three potential to win. Um, you know, not not in the highest probability of draws. So it's not like it's not quite as all in as like a deck like Medium Red is, which I think a deck like Medium Red gets a lot better once you're in once you're under the Sorensen Mulligan rules because it's really trying to high roll a Soul Land effect or a Mana Crypt or a Soul Ring. Uh, to play a high high impact four drop, it's really playing as an aggressive deck with mid range size threats in it, uh, which is kind of what this deck does too. But it probably does a little bit less effectively under Sorensen Mulligan rules, but a little more effectively, I think, under standard Mulligan rules, if that makes sense. Um, so it's going to have higher probability median draws that are very good that win a lot more games than I think the medium uh, the medium red deck does. 
um, but less nut draws, which become more viable when you get to see more cards under the Sorensen Mulligan rules. And that's kind of why I think you see the the uh, the popping up of like medium style decks. Um, and there was a very recent North 100, you know, show on on the power, you know, that that certain decks can have in the format um, due to the Sorensen Mulligan rule. Um, you know, and essentially the ability by second five to have seen 33 cards in your deck. And what I mean by that is with the Sorensen Mulligan rule, you see seven, you see six plus scry, six plus scry, five plus scry, five plus scry. If you add all those cards up, that's 29 cards um, plus uh, four scries that, you know, adds up to 33 cards. Now, I'm not saying that sees 33% exactly of your deck. It could. You're probably going to see some redundant cards as well. But even as an aggregate capacity of thirty three being able to see thirty three percent of your deck, any deck that has nut draws is gonna be uh it's gonna be favored by that style of mulliganing because you're just seeing such a large array of cards. That's why, you know, when they, they talk through that in their episode, I don't want to go too in depth in their episode because that's their content. Um, you know, they they talk through like the the value of um of knowing how to mulligan your deck and mulliganing more aggressively under that that pl- that that method of playing the game, um, that deck's this deck's not built for that. Uh, it's it's built more so to play a a higher probability median draw, uh, while still having you know a a nut draw uh, in it. I think you definitely want the nut draw, but I think also if you're playing by quote unquote more fair Magic standards, i.e. standard mulligan rules, um, I, I one think you tend to get better games of Magic, uh, which I'm actually about, like, it sounds kind of weird to say, like, I like Fair Magic. I do like to play a good game of Magic. I don't like just to run someone over on turn two. Like, to me, it's like, eh, you know, I play Vintage for that, you know? Like, and even there, like, you know, that doesn't always happen. It happens a lot less than people think when they just, you know, look at the format and see the cards that are in it. Um, but I like to play a good game of Magic, and I think this deck allows you to do that. I think at its core, it's a very fair deck. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a fair, unfair deck, right? Like, it just plays the best of everything. Um, and it's kind of designed to just top out top deck uh, other decks. Um, has very high card quality, which allows it to generally go one for one on a pretty even footing with the blue decks and eventually just power over them. Um, you know, basically just keep continually keep um, them reacting to you until they just can't react to you anymore and they die. Um, against the aggro decks, it just the higher card quality just tends to bury them. Like you know, there's not much they can do against Kitchen Finks, Knight of Autumn, you know, or a four or five toughness thing. Um, it's just very tough for for you know those kind of decks to deal with it. Um, so I do think it's a very very powerful deck. I'm going to continue to tune this this deck up. Um, I if it's not not you know blatantly obvious, like I, I very much so love this deck. I'm very passionate about this deck. Um, I spent a lot of time um, in in my life uh, you know piloting decks of this variety, like kind of like the four and five color pile decks, um, because I think they're very fun to play. I think they offer a lot of pilot decision making. I think they're very fun to build and template. Um, and I think in general, like, you know, everyone has a good time playing with these decks because they're not really oppressive in the way that some decks are. Um, they're kind of oppressive in the same way Jeskai is, because I think this is a fairly match-neutral deck. Um, I think it's as good as Jeskai. No, I think you probably... I think Jeskai's probably a better deck in general, um, but it doesn't have the nut draws this deck has, um, so it does assume some liabilities as well. Um, but in general, it just plays a good game of Magic at the end of the day. It's going to scale well with your experience with it and your knowledge of your own deck and your knowledge of your metagame and the cards that are played in the format. And um, to me, that's good magic. Like, yeah, that's why I enjoy decks like this, why I enjoy tuning them, playing them. And, um, yeah, I have been for over a decade, like, this this type of deck. Um, and, you know, varieties of this build, you know, I've played from, you know, having, like, Thragtus-style value mid-range chains in them um, to, you know, playing, like, you know, 10-plus Planeswalkers where I was trying to outvalue a bunch of decks um, to this build, which is more slammed to the ground and is a lot more aggressive to beat up on combo decks that are a lot more viable in, uh, in Canadian Highlander over where I first started playing this deck, which is in Eurolander, or German Highlander. Um, so anyways, guys, I hope this video was informative on this deck archetype. I hope it showed you a lot of cool games that I got to play with it against a pretty wide field. Um, you know, right now, this deck's doing very well for me. Like I, like I was saying, it's 15-1. It's to 1. You got to see my one loss against Red Deck Wins where I kind of just had some bad moles and just didn't wasn't able to chain a good draw together. Um, I think the deck's very, very good. I think, you know, the more you play it, the more you pilot it, and the more you tune it for what you want to beat, it can do a lot of work for you. Um, so anyways, you know, very cool deck. I hope you guys enjoyed the deck tech, or the deck refinement piece, the concluding piece here, kind of on, you know, my, my thoughts on the build, and also the gameplay. Um, I'll probably be back at with, more with uh, some more non-blue decks next time. We're either going to be doing red deck wins next time, or 
black, white, death, and taxes, or maybe medium white. I may just do white, uh, white, white death and taxes, which right now I think the best builds of it are probably medium style or like drazi white decks. Um, yeah, but I'll probably do another non-white or non-blue deck next time. So I did a lot of blue decks initially, and I kind of want to jump over to some other, you know, varieties of, of gameplay and magic because, like, while I do enjoy playing blue decks, I enjoy playing stuff like this too. I think you know this this deck offers you a lot of great decisions, plays a good game of magic, you know, not an oppressive game of magic, you know, but um, but one that's pretty strong and is well suited to to play a lot of different different decks. Um, so, anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed it and take care now.